Madam Chair, council members and participants, we are now live. Thank you. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committee committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. I now note that the hour has come. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called. Also, please say a few brief words when responding so that your image will be displayed on screen when you speak. Madam Clerk? Council Member Heenan? Council Member O? Good morning, Madam Chair and colleagues. I'm present for the hearing. Council Member Gim? Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, colleagues. I am here. Council Member Green? Um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Council staff, colleagues. Um, it's a pleasure to be here for today's hearing. Council Member Thomas? Good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon to the listening public. Council Member Brooks? And Chair Bass? Thank you, uh, Madam Clerk, and I am present. A quorum of the committee is present, and this hearing is now called to order. This is the public hearing of the Committee on Public Health and Human Services regarding Bill Number 210364 and Resolution Number 210459. Madam Clerk, will you please read the title of the bill and the resolution? Bill Number 210364 an ordinance amending various chapters of the Philadelphia Code to address matters related to the availability of feminine hygiene products in city facilities and making certain technical changes all under certain terms and conditions. Resolution number 210459, resolution authorizing the Committee on Public Health and Human Services to hold hearings regarding mobile crisis units. Thank you. Before we begin to hear testimony, from the witnesses we have for today. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that this public hearing is being recorded. Because the hearing is public, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in the meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to recognizing members for the questions or comments they have for the witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Before I call on the clerk to begin the, to call the first panel, would any of my colleagues like to make any opening comments? Okay, and seeing none, I would like to ask the clerk to please call forward the first three, or actually the first panel uh, of witnesses to testify. Madam Clerk. The first panel includes Cynthia Figueroa, Deputy Mayor. Okay. And uh, I want to be clear that we're calling witnesses on bill number 210364. So our first speaker. Uh, witness for today is Deputy Mayor Cynthia Figueroa. Um, Madam uh, Clerk, uh, just called you forward. Please state your name for the uh, for the record and begin with your testimony. Good afternoon, um, Council members and Madam Chair on this beautiful Friday afternoon. My name is Cynthia Figueroa. I'm the Deputy Mayor for the Office of Children and Families. Um, thank you so much for having me here today to testify. As the Deputy Mayor of the Office of Children and Families, my office oversees the Department of Human Services, Parks and Recreation, and the Free Library. I'm here today to testify regarding Bill Number 210364, addressing matters related to the availability of hygiene products in certain city facilities, 
specifically health centers, recreation centers, and libraries. I want to thank you, Council Madam Chair and Council for highlighting this important issue facing our city, the nation, and the world. Also, thank you, Council Member Bass, for your leadership and your diligent fight to working to bring dignity to our city's residents on a sensitive matter that often goes unaddressed. As you are aware, period poverty or the in inability to afford menstrual sanitary products is a growing public health crisis that affects low income or housing insecure women, girls, transgender and non-binary individuals. The administration agrees with the intent of this purpose of this legislation as proposed to be amended and will therefore provide these products at designated facilities that are staffed by city employees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on this critical matter. Again, thank you, Madam Chair, for your leadership to reduce barriers to address this necessary issue. My staff and I and members of the departments are here to answer any questions. I wanna thank you for your support of uh, this bill. I think uh, as, well, I know as a woman, any of us who have ever had uh, the, the misfortune, if you will, of needing a feminine hygiene product and not being able to obtain it um, is, is terrifying and, um, you know, just really, really uh, something that can be um, humiliating, uh, to say the least. I think that this bill and these products being provided will go a long way to addressing something that we know is happening in our city day in and day out, and that is period poverty. Period poverty is something we can fix, and I believe that with this bill, we're going to fix it in Philadelphia right here and right now. So I just really want to say thank you so much for your support of what it is that uh, we are trying to accomplish here and uh, uh, the willingness to be a part of a team to make it happen, to really support Philadelphians, particularly when we look at things that we all, as the administration I know often does, uh, looks at these matters through a racial equity lens and uh, trying to address some things that have been um, done in the past that were really um, uh, inappropriate and not only inappropriate, but just really just in general harmful uh, to people of color and to women and uh, young girls. So I thank you for your support. And um, are there any other questions from members of the committee? Okay, and seeing none, I'm going to ask Madam Clerk to call forward the next panel of witnesses. Our next panel includes Reverend Dr. Michelle Ann Simmons, CEO and founder of Why Not Prosper, and Maureen May, registered nurse, president of Pennsylvania's Association of Staff Nurses and Allied Professionals. Thank you. In that order, can you please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony? Hello. Hello. We have our witnesses available. Hi, I'm Maureen May. Okay. Yes. Please state, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Okay. Uh, thank you. My name is Maureen May, and I'm a registered nurse at Temple University Hospital. I am a maternal health nurse at Temple University Hospital and the president of PASNAP. I would like to share with you and with my testimony that I am a woman who cares for women. And I want to commend you, Council Member Bass, for sponsoring the practical, progressive, necessary legislation we're discussing today. It's a bill made all more critical by the coronavirus pandemic, which has devastated many Philadelphia area families and has severely limited their ability to pay for necessities, necessities like tampon pads for women and girls used to manage their periods. Tampons and pads are not luxury items. They are basic human needs. Women and girls need tampons and pads to fully function in American society, to go to work, to go to school, to participate in civic life, and most of all, to maintain their dignity. If they don't have them because they can afford them, it's period poverty. And poverty in all its dimensions is an important public health issue. 
Yet far too long, lawnmakers all over the globe have been largely silent about period poverty, and particularly its devastating effects on young women. A teen who skips school for five days a month simply because she doesn't have the tampons or pads she needs to manage her period is undereducated and frankly undervalued by our system. That's changing rapidly thanks to women lawmakers like Councilmember Bass and those I see sitting here on the committee. But it can't change fast enough. Year after year, the data shows that men in the U.S. typically earn more than women and that women are more likely to live in poverty, unable to afford the barest necessities. And a recent study of low-income women published in the Medical of Journal of, of Obstetrics and Gynecology bears this out, revealing the indignity and shame that many women who live in poverty experience. <laughs> Two-thirds of women surveyed in the study said that they don't have the resources to buy the menstrual hygiene products at some point in their period. And one-fifth of the respondents said that they struggle to afford period products on a monthly basis. Some said they had to choose between tampons and pads. What did the women of the study do? do? Well, they said they use cloth, rags, toilet tissue, paper, paper towels from public bathrooms. This study was conducted across the globe. It was surveyed women here in St. Louis, Missouri, not far from home. The survey underscored the fact that period products are often the very last things that get paid for. And as a result, their necessities of impoverished women and girls and often they're forced to go without. WIC covers period products, SNAP doesn't cover them. Health insurance should cover them. Until it does, Bill number 210364 and its proposed proposal to make period products available upon request that city health centers, rec centers, and libraries is addressing that important aspect of women's health and a deficit, a real on the ground inequity that is absolutely within our power to fix. The city of Philadelphia's excellent health care, let's be known for a city that acknowledges and honors the health needs, including food products and the dignity of the girls and women. Today, today, let's be the city of sisterly love and pass bill number 210364 out of committee. Thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here today, um, and we're going to hold questions until uh, the next speaker uh, speaks on this panel. Uh, if that next speaker is available, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Is it? Hello, Dr. Michelle. Robin Simmons speaking. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, my name is Reverend Dr. Michelle Simmons, and I am the a founder and the director of Why Not Prosper. And I want to testify to the fact that I think it would be very supportive for feminine hygiene stations to be placed throughout our city in any city facility, rather it's a school, rather it's a building. Um, I feel like just having a, a tampon station that's accessible or, um, would be very helpful. Uh, I've seen it done in some of our suburban communities, um, and I feel like, you know, it will definitely be supportive. Um, I don't know the cost analysis of it, but a lot of it just makes sense to add. And I also want to put on a record that I think this also needs to happen uh, in the city, but also in the prison. Uh, I feel like the women are being charged for sanitary napkins and products now. And I don't know where that came from, but we need to dismantle that as well. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Reverend Sim Simmons, and for, for the, all of the work that you do, uh, and, and um, uh, Nurse May as well. 
um, for the work that you guys both do throughout uh, the city of Philadelphia. Uh, Reverend Simmons, we, we know each other well from uh, mm -hmm, Germantown mm -hmm. and, and from your yes. crisis center for women uh, in Germantown. And I want to mm -hmm. inform everyone and, and just, just make sure that folks know that we currently give out uh, a number of different products in the city of Philadelphia health clinics. Um, you know, we give out condoms and birth control and we give out, um, you know, other medical, uh, medically necessary products. This is not an optional product. This is, uh, well, it's optional for men. <laughs> it's not optional for women. Um, and this is something that is a medically necessary product. And so uh, our uh, attempt here is to make sure that these medically necessary products uh, are available um, throughout the city of Philadelphia. You have and an so, uh, And so we're going to continue uh, our work on this, and we look forward to working with both of you ladies and uh, with uh, Deputy Mayor Figueroa and the Department of Health to make sure that we have a smooth implementation uh, of this uh, critical piece of legislation. So thank you so much for being here and for the work that you're doing on behalf of women. And so therefore, on behalf of all of us in the city of Philadelphia, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and that being said, are there any other questions from members of the committee? Okay, and seeing none, is there anyone else who is here to testify on bill number 210364 and we have not ca called your name? Going once, going twice for bill number 210364. Okay, um, that being said, we are going to now move to resolution number 210459. Madam Clerk, will you please read the title of the resolution? Resolution number 210459, a resolution authorizing the Committee on Public Health and Human Services to hold hearings regarding mobile crisis units. Thank you. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the first panel of witnesses we have to testify on resolution number 210459? The first panel of witnesses includes Dr. Jill Bowen, Commissioner for Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. Roland Lamb, Deputy Commissioner for Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, the Planning Innov Innovation Division. Rachel Eisenberg, Director of the Office of Criminal Justice. And Staff Inspector Francis Healy, Special Assistant to the Poli Philadelphia Police Commissioner. Okay, thank you very much. Um, if we could have uh, folks come forward to testify in that order, starting with Dr. Jill Bowen. Please state your name for the record and begin. Uh, Dr. Jill Bowen, Commissioner, Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. Good afternoon, Chairperson Cindy Bass and members of the Committee on Public Health and Human Services. With me today is Roland Lamb, Deputy Commissioner, and Dave Ayers, Program Manager in our Behavioral Health and Justice Division. Thank you for this opportunity to give testimony in response to resolution number 210459 regarding mobile crisis response. Today I will speak about the planned expansion of community mobile crisis teams and will be available to answer questions about DBHIDS's collaboration with the Office of Criminal Justice and the Philadelphia Police Department, PPD. One of DBHIDS's priorities is transforming the behavioral health crisis system and working to ensure the best possible response for individuals experiencing behavioral health crises in the community. Philadelphia's approach is to develop a continuum of response options within which the level of response will match the needs and circumstances of each 911 call, always factoring in public safety, responder safety, and the safety and needs of the person in crisis. Identification of the appropriate response depends on the information gleaned from each call, which guides choice of response to match the needs of each call whether that response be police only, CIT trained police, co-response teams, or behavioral health only response. 
DBHIDS is actively working to expand staffing of the Philadelphia Crisis Line, the PCL, operated by DBHIDS to enable the police radio room to transfer behavioral health related crisis calls to a behavioral health professional. DBHIDS also is working to expand citywide mobile crisis services 24 seven with the addition of mobile response team capacity to respond to behavioral health related 911 calls and direct calls to the PCL that do not require police involvement. A request for proposals RFP is scheduled to be issued in June 2021. Responses will be due in July and awards expected to be issued in September with anticipation of new services implementation to begin in November of 2021. DBHIDS currently has two providers that have community mobile crisis response team, John F. Kennedy JFK and the consortium. JFK currently provides 24 seven coverage across the entire city and the consortium is currently operating part time and working to scale up to provide that 24 seven coverage. The request for proposals will allow us to identify two additional providers to stand up 24 seven community mobile crisis response teams. The number of teams proposed is based on the current call volume to the PCL line and the number of behavioral health calls that come in through the 911 system, which is anticipated to approximately double the number of calls into the PCL. When all four providers are on board, 24 seven coverage will occur with the city being divided into four regions. Each provider will cover a region and each will have three units, one for each shift for the 24 seven coverage. Metrics and outcomes from the implementation of the four community mobile crisis response teams, in addition to the Philadelphia crisis line call volume, will advise us if additional expansion is needed. We will monitor the initial implementation and keep the administration and stakeholders updated on our progress and additional needs that may arise. In closing, DBHIDS is deeply committed to improving health outcomes for the people of Philadelphia. We can achieve this with continuous integration and in systems that allow us to identify and address social determinants of health, including working with the PD, PPD and our other stakeholders. We will continue to work closely with our city partners, community organizations, and stakeholder groups to enhance awareness of available resources and explore opportunities to develop new resources that best serve the people of Philadelphia. We are confident that deepening our partnerships and collaborations with these stakeholder groups will help people access vital supports and services when they may be at their most vulnerable and most in need. We are thankful to the members of City Council for their advocacy for individuals with behavioral health concerns and intellectual disabilities. We are fortunate to have your support in advocating for resources and deeper collaborations. I welcome the opportunity to provide additional information and we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is uh, Mr. Lamb going to testify today or is he there with you as backup? Questions to, to help answer questions. Okay, very good. Uh, I believe our next panelist is Rachel Eisenberg. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairperson. For the, oh, I'm sorry. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Sure. Good afternoon, Chairperson Bass, members of the City Council Committee on Public Health and Human Services, and members of the public. My name is Rachel Eisenberg, and I'm the director of the City's Office of Criminal Justice. Thank you for the opportunity to give testimony in response to resolution number 210459. The Office of Criminal Justice is part of the Managing Director's Office of Policy and Strategic Initiatives for Criminal Justice and Public Safety. One key goal of, of OCJ is to increase opportunities to divert and deflect people away from the criminal justice system at the point of police contact. To accomplish this goal, OCJ works collaboratively with various city departments, service providers, and community stakeholders in an effort to connect people to services as an alternative to their involvement with the justice system. The 911 triage and co-responder program is a big part of our work. 
OCJ has been collaborating with the Philadelphia Police Department and the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services since 2018 to develop a co-responder model for Philadelphia. OCJ serves as a convener and coordinates the planning and implementation efforts. Co-responder models can vary from city to city, but generally involve law enforcement and behavioral health professionals responding together to calls for service for people experiencing a behavioral health crisis. These models provide law enforcement with appropriate alternatives to arresting someone in crisis and have been shown to also decrease jail admissions, reduce psychiatric hospitalizations, and increase access to treatment in the community. Philadelphia is joining a growing number of jurisdictions across the country to implement co-responder models, including what very well-established programs in Los Angeles, Houston, and Denver, to name only a few. I should note that the establishment of a co-responder program in Philadelphia is only one part of a larger effort to change how we meet the needs of people in crisis who call 911. Commissioner Bowen described the expansion of the mobile crisis response and enhancements to the Philadelphia crisis line that are in the works. Our goal for this collaboration in the future is to grow capacity for mobile crisis teams to respond directly to certain 911 calls without police involvement. As was made clear by the killing of Walter Wallace Jr. as he was experiencing a crisis episode, we recognize that more holistic changes to the 911 system are needed, especially for black communities and other communities of color who have distrust of police. Efforts are underway to improve how 911 call takers identify when someone is in crisis and how we ensure the most appropriate responder is dispatched to assist. This involves the police department rolling out a modified crisis intervention team training for 911 staff, incorporating a behavioral health script for the call takers to use, and the assignment of a behavioral health navigator to support 911 in identifying and triaging calls for people in crisis. Last April, or this past April, the city began piloting its version of a co-responder model known as the Crisis Intervention Response Team, or CERT. The goal of the CERT program is to increase de-escalation, reduce arrests, and increase service connections for people in crisis who call 911. The CERT program is an active partnership between the Philadelphia Police Department and the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. This partnership pairs behavioral health professionals with, with CIT trained police officers to respond to people in crisis. The model also includes peer specialist teams that provide connections to services for people once an immediate crisis has been de-escalated and follow up late, later to make sure that people still have the support they need in the community. Prior to launching the CERT pilot, the assigned officers and behavioral health staff participated in a specialized 80-hour training program. This program was designed by police and behavioral health training experts and incorporated principles from both fields. It also allowed for team building and cohesion among staff and offered simulations of real scenarios that, that the CERT teams will encounter in the field. The CERT pilot involves four behavioral health and officer paired units and two peer teams that are currently assigned to supervision within the existing police service details. They are engaging with people who are experiencing a crisis by monitoring police radio or being called in to support patrol officers. If other officers are on the scene when CERT the CERT teams arrive, they're able to resume patrol. The CERT teams actively engage with the person experiencing a crisis, work to de-escalate as much as possible, and identify an appropriate connection to services for the person. The behavioral health professionals that are part of the CERT team help tap into a range of service options available in the community, from housing to treatment to basic needs. In the early weeks of the pilot, we are continuing to develop, to develop the program based on people's experiences. We will also be doing a series of listening sessions and community meetings to help inform how the model grows. We are actively collaborating with community partners who have been providing feedback on dis different aspects of the pilot. We're also working with peer cities across the country as, as who are rolling out similar programs. We're always looking to engage with residents and, or and organizations who want to share their feedback. We have regular meetings with community stakeholders because we know that we can't design these programs and services in a vacuum if we want to see meaningful change in the city. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to provide testimony today. Um, and myself and my colleagues are available from PPD and DBH are available for questions from the committee. 
Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we're now going to hear from the third uh, person on this panel. That would be, uh, I believe, Staff Inspector Francis Healy. Uh, and Staff Inspector Francis Healy, uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Um, I believe Inspector Healy is is due to be available for questions. Oh, I see. Okay, very good, very good. So, uh, well, thank you very much again to the entire panel for being here. I think that we are really on the cusp of doing something, um, you know, that's uh, number one is a little bit overdue, but number two, how we think of policing, how we think of, um, you know, uh, addressing issues within our community, particularly mental health issues has greatly and dramatically changed in the last few years. And I'm glad to see that we are moving forward and uh, uh, doing things in a different way um, that would reduce the amount of involvement with the Philadelphia Police Department and at the same time add the mental health component, which we know is greatly, greatly needed in the city. Um, I'm wondering if someone could talk to us, um, Dr. Bowen or Rachel, if you could talk to us about um, involving or actually mobile crisis units versus the co-responder model. One of the things that I heard from advocates today, and I'm sure we'll hear further, is that it should be either or. Um, and so I'm wondering if I could hear your professional opinion on that, um, you know, on, on what you think the uh, appropriate model. Should it be both models? Should it be one model? Um, uh, can we effectively do both? I know sometimes in the city of Philadelphia, we don't really walk into the sun at the same time very well. So is this something we should do at the same time? Um, can you elaborate on that? So why don't I start with that? And then uh, Rachel, you can um, jump in um, because that's how we collaborate and that's what we would need to do in, in this model. Um, let me start by saying uh, it, it does not need to be an either or, it can be um, a both. And the idea in the Philadelphia model is um, to offer the opportunity to connect um, to uh, different uh, responses depending on what the individual issue is that comes into 911. As you as you well know, that the current situation um, is that the calls going into 911 were all answered by police. So rolling out the co-response was already a move in the direction to add behavioral health uh, expertise to the situation. And in order to prepare for this multi-pronged approach, uh, a um, script was developed, um, training was developed, and uh, a good deal of time with a navigator embedded in the 911 system to really understand the kinds of calls that were coming in to 911 when folks were in crisis. And when those calls involved behavioral health, folks in distress with behavioral health challenges, they were not all the same. And some of them involved um, situations where there was a, a need for police and situations where there was no need for police. Therefore, we developed um, responses that match the needs of the, the call. Um, so we do see this as uh, an and and not an or model. I do want to say that we have also received information from, from advocates and from, from stakeholders, some of whom feel quite strongly that um, this should be an only behavioral health uh, response. Um, but most folks um, that we've heard from are okay with it having some other options such as co-response um, as long as there is also a component that is behavioral health only um, so that for calls that do not require any police involvement, there is a robust response within the system. So that is where we um, stand right now. Um, but we are very aware that we need to evaluate these models. They are all culture change. These are significant changes in the way we are shifting a system that has been in place for a long time, and we are shifting it 
to a model that will increasingly have um, responses that don't involve uh, police at all. Um, but there is a um, aspect to the model that we are rolling out that includes the co-response. And I just want to say that our early feedback on the um, this pilot um, rollout has been very um, positive um, in that it has resulted in no injuries, uh, no arrests, and um, a time to spend to, to de-escalate and to work with the person in distress in a very different way than a, a police-only response would have been before co-response was on the ground at all. Rachel, did you want to add to that? Um, thank you, Commissioner Bowen. I just think the, in addition to everything that you mentioned, one thing I would add is that what we're learning from you know, this process and from speaking to other jurisdictions who are grappling with the same challenges is that you know, this range of options uh, really allows our system and, and our community to assess what, what the needs of the individual are and provide that range of responses. So I think uh, it really, as Commissioner said, doesn't need to be an either or. And many places like us are kind of exploring um, standing up and or building on multiple models and focusing attention on, on, on um, accurately discerning what the appropriate type of response is when someone calls 911. And that itself is a, you know, is, is, is a, an undertaking that, you know, needs a lot of attention. I see Francis Healy has joined us. Uh, and Staff Inspector Healy, um, did you want to make a comment? Um, you know, I, I apologize. I was actually just finishing up a CIT class up at the academy. Um, no, I'm so far. I'm very happy with the with the the format that we're trying to work out in Philadelphia. We're trying to make it very specific to Philadelphia, and working in collaboration with the DBH IDS has been a, a real. There's a synergy created. Um, we're, we're pooling our resources together to try to come up with uh, the pools in which we can uh, actually like put, put these calls from 911 so we can better address and better make sure or, or more accurately identify and then hopefully focus the right resources for these individuals as they may come in. And, and that, that will be a challenge without a doubt. But I think the fact that we're, we're already trying to understand this process is um, a, a huge step in the right direction. The mental health uh, behavioral script that we are that we implemented with the assistance of DBH uh, IDS they have helped develop it and we've since tweaked it um, I will honestly say it's probably radically changed how the police officers are responding to these assignments or to crisis related assignments irrespective of the um, co-responder model we have CIT trained officers out in the field we've had them for a long time um, but we are better utilizing them as a result of that script they're being immediately dispatched so I'm getting two CIT officers to more assignments more often than ever before. And I think that's a win in and of itself. Excellent, excellent. Um, question for the panel. Um, and then we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna open it up to my colleagues, but we all saw the video uh, many times, <clears throat> excuse me, of the tragic events around um, what happened to Mr. Walter Wallace, who was having a mental health crisis and um, the outcome was that he was killed, um, you know, uh, by a police officer. Can you can you talk to us about what would happen with a uh, a mobile response unit, and um, what what would happen now? Walk us through, if you can, what would happen now? What would we expect in something like that same situation of someone having a mental health crisis, a family calling in distress. We want help with our loved one, but we don't want to lose our loved one. Um, what, what would we expect as um, citizens of Philadelphia now? Uh, can I jump in there real quickly from the police department's perspective? Um, like, as I just mentioned, the mental health call script is the key. Uh, um, for officers to de-escalate situations, oftentimes they have to shift. I, I do this in training. I, I reference shifting gears from crime fighter mode to actually social worker mode. The sooner they can do that, the more likelihood de-escalation can occur and things can slow down. 
In the case that you just mentioned, um, what would be different today is the fact that most likely there'd be two CIT officers dispatched if the because the family did not mention anything originally on the police radio. However, the script in essence pulls that information out of the call callers from our dispatchers. Our dispatchers are also now chained in de-escalation skills as well with a minister or with a mini CIT training course. But I think what the difference would be is the officers would have that information before responding to the scene, and that would entitle them or enable them to actually slow down. Uh, it's not a crime in progress and to actually respond probably in a slower fashion. And like I said, oftentimes things escalate and then uh, force is necessary to get out of a certain situation. I think now the officer would be with that information would slow down. I mean, the approaching the step is, you know, as they, we all saw the video and they move right directly up to the steps. Um, they may have taken a more tactically advantaged position. Uh, I can't, I don't on a second guess, second quarterback it, but with that additional information, that's exactly what we're trying to get our CI2 officers in tune with. The ability to, to de-escalate, slow down, and we often try to do that once you're on scene in split seconds. So ability to get some more information to the officer why they're responding to the call is incredibly important. Also, like I mentioned very briefly, the, uh, um, this, the uh, dispatcher CIT training. Now that's an eight hour block of training, but I think you have to fully understand the value of the dispatcher in the de-escalation process. Their ability oh, to absolutely. actually de-escalate the, the caller is incredibly important, but also in the manner in which they dispatch the calls. I mean, they understand we're all humans. Uh, dispatcher t dispatches it in, in, in like oh, use extreme caution. We don't what you have out there. The officers will respond in, in more tense. So the ability to actually calm it down, you're actually de-escalating the officers before they get on scene, providing information. So I think the difference would be uh, between night and day from what happened last year as to what the response would be today. To be honest with you. And I would agree with uh, um, Inspector yeah. Healy. Um, having a behavioral health presence. Uh, is calming for um, the officer as well as for the individual and um, and for the family. And one of the uh, early outcomes that we see from um, the co-response uh, on the ground is how much the family is engaged. And anyone who saw that video um, saw um, the family uh, also in tremendous distress and working very hard to communicate um, and this uh, scenario with behavioral health uh, on the ground, um, there would be engagement um, quickly. And so some of the early responses um, to some of the co-response um, so far include uh, engaging families, connecting families to supports. Um, so I think we would have um, had a very different scenario um, if that was occurring today. Quick question, um, uh, Staff Inspector Healy. Uh, one of the things you just mentioned was that uh, if if the call came in, if the Walter Wallace call came in today, that one of the differences would be it would sort of things would slow down a little bit. And I just want to make sure that we're still prioritizing the call because I know that calls are prioritized based on if a crime is being committed. A crime is not being committed, but a family is still in distress. So can you can you address that real quickly? <clears throat> yes, as I mentioned, with the, with the mental health call script, the, pri the calls will be categorized as a certain way. If it's a person with a weapon, it's a person with a weapon. However, the additional information that the family can provide over 911 is being pushed out to the police officers through the dispatchers when they dispatch the assignment. So a person with a weapon used caution officer could be a potential 302 would be the terminology probably pushed out rather than it's a person with a weapon used caution. That sets the whole tone of how those officers respond. That's, and that's very much part of the entire CIT training, separate and apart from the co-responder training. So we're spending the right people to the right assignments. That's first and foremost, which are the CIT officers. And uh, we will have, you know, in the future, many more co-responding units available. But um, I think that's what we're, we're talking about. The CIT officers are trained. That's the time is really the, the best friend they have. And I think it, it, to differentiate response time to the event is different than when you're there. Um, the slowing down once you're there um, is critically important because you're taking the time to really engage um, the individual in distress and the family. So when we talk about this slowing um, down, that is a, once you're there and on site, um, taking the time to really uh, engage, develop that rapport and um, 
some some level of trust uh, is uh, incredibly important, and in many respects ends up in a, a place where the the person, the family, and the behavioral health professional are um, on the same page in terms of what the next steps um, can be that would be helpful. And we are seeing, you know, a lot of examples of that in in the early days of the pilot, where the uh, of the co-responder pilot, where you know these units are able to take the time with individuals, and you know where the initial um, circumstance may have looked like someone was unwilling to um, accept services voluntarily over the course of that interaction, and actually going through the steps to de-escalate, people end up becoming a lot more willing to get a connection to services and uh, that will potentially kind of uh, meet their needs over the long term. And if I may, I mean, I, I believe that you will be hearing on this panel from um, consortium from um, Mr. White, but you'll find the mobile teams also um, incredibly responsive in, in developing um, rapport of that sort um, so that the outcome is, uh, is one that, um, uh, folks are um, calm and are able to together um, figure out the best next steps. Excellent, excellent. Okay, thank you very much for your responses. Um, Chair recognizes Council Member Thomas. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. I um, want to thank uh, you for your leadership as well as uh, Dr. Borwin and her team for being here today. I want to just uh, put a couple um, things on the record. I'm sorry, Commissioner Borwin. I just want to put a couple of things um, on the record as far as questions, and if we can just give some responses, I'm going to run down these questions, and as many responses as we can get today would be appreciated. And what can't be answered today, um, please follow up with this. Uh, so, first of all, we would like to know um, how much are the folks that are being paid? How much are the folks going to be paid that are going to be working in the mobile crisis unit? Um, we also want to know: Is the department intentional? Um, is it the department's intention that the mobile crisis response unit? workers uh, will have access to health care benefits. Um, we also want to know about the non-police co-responders. Does anyone um, on the panel know how much they'll be paid as well, too? Uh, we want to also um, know about the evaluation process. So how does uh, DBH IDS and the MDL plan to evaluate both the mobile crisis unit as well as the, the co-responder uh, model? Um, how will it be measuring the success? And of course, will you be able to make that data? Um, available to city council. So I'll um, jump in. Um, we do expect providers to um, be be paying a, a good wage and to be, um, you know, providing health care. But I would have to get you those specifics. I don't have them at my fingertips. I know that Dave Ayers may be on this call and might be able to give specifics, but more likely we can get you that. Um, and forward that to you. Um, as far as the evaluation process, so there's um, uh, a fair amount of work going into figuring out the, the outcomes for, for sure. We're interested in outcomes that um, uh, reflect response times, that reflect um, uh, outcomes and follow-ups. Um, we're looking for um, fewer uh, trips to emergency rooms or CRCs. We're looking for voluntary um, agreement for um, um, treatment as opposed to anything that would involve involuntary um, commitments. Um, so there are a number of um, uh, evaluations and outcome measures. We are looking also to gather um, the interest of stakeholders in what they would like to see in terms of the outcomes. So that is very much um, in development, but you have a sense of the types of um, outcomes we would be looking for. Thank you. I think that we're going to want to continue to dialogue around uh, comparable salaries to these employees um, compared to other type of employees who respond to 911 calls. We think that there should be um, they should be similar in salaries. Again, we also want to put the emphasis on uh, city council having uh, some type of uh, communication and transparency as it relates to the evaluation process and just that ongoing dialogue to assure that we're doing things in, in, in doing things in a way that work. Um, I will submit the rest of the questions in writing and I will pass on my time because I know a couple of my colleagues have questions as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Member. 
uh, chair recognizes council member Kim. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And I just want to thank, um, you know, our previous panelists uh, earlier, Cynthia Figueroa, um, for the important work that they're doing. And um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Bowen in particular for being a partner on developing the mobile crisis units um, for uh, ensuring that we'll get full funding for the four mobile crisis units that the city of Philadelphia will be pushing through this year. Um, I do, though, want to uh, state that I think that there is a difference here. Um, and I think it's important to clarify that because, you know, our council body um, has worked extremely hard on support for the vision of the mobile crisis units. Um, we've been working very closely with a broad group of providers um, known as the care, uh, you know, the, the uh, broader group of um, coalition providers who are looking uh, for uh, mental health treatment, social workers, and supports for people who are in distress. Um, and one of the things that I think I want to be very clear about is that there is some tension between the co-responder model and the mobile crisis response model. Um, law enforcement response to mental health crises is clearly disfavored by the mental health clinician field, as evidenced by federal SAMHSA guidelines, which clearly state that mental health first responders should, quote unquote, respond without law enforcement accompaniment unless special circumstances warrant their inclusion. Our concern here is that um, while I recognize uh, that we are, you know, doing a Philadelphia model where there's, you know, a co-responder on the one hand and a mobile crisis unit on the other, is that the reality is, is that the majority of people will seek 911 until we can get a clear um, uh, advancement on the uh, on the mobile crisis units and for people who are clearly experiencing mental health distress, they don't need to call 911. They could call maybe another three digit number. Um, but I think what you're hearing uh, from the tensions that are existing right now between the different uh, groups is that uh, a law enforcement response, um, even with some training is not the same as uh, mental health clinicians responding. And so my first question is, how did the co-responder model actually come to be developed instead of a mobile crisis expansion in the first place? So I'm gonna see if Rachel, because you were here at the time and developing that, maybe you can speak to that. Sure, I mean, and I think, you know, a point of clarification was that, um, you know, the, the co-responder, uh, pilot was never sort of developed um, instead of a, mo a mobile crisis expansion. I think the way that we're thinking about these programs in existence is that they, you know, again, they act kind of to complement one another. Um, and that the, the co-responder, the idea for a co-responder model really came out of um, efforts that have, you know, have been underway in the city to try and reduce the number of people who are in our jails and thinking about alternatives at the point of law enforcement contact. And so, um, you know, through initial seed funding from the MacArthur Foundation, uh, we began exploring uh, co-responder as a way to deflect people away from the criminal justice system. And so um, the, the, as as this model or as the conversations around this model have grown and you know the mobile crisis expansion has also um you know become has also grown um you know we're really thinking about these things as as kind of link you know linked with one another and and using the opportunity when someone calls 911 and hopefully in the future other numbers other than 911 um as, as kind of variations that are available depending on the nature of the call. And so recognizing that, you know, a co-responder model was never going to be the silver bullet. It was never going to kind of resolve all types of, or meet the needs of all types of callers to 911 um, is kind of part of a larger continuum. If I may, council member, I think that um, uh, we're in alignment with SAMHSA and that we really are looking for behavioral health only responses unless there are 
um, special circumstances. And I think that those special circumstances, which would have had a police only response is where we would then have a behavioral health and police co-response, not sending police when behavioral health uh, response is appropriate. And um, I, I do know that there are, this is a tension point and I, it's, it's um, I think an important conversation and um, you know the, that's one of the reasons why the monitoring and evaluation is so is so important, and for people to see what this co-response actually looks like on the ground, the early indications are um, that it's a you know it's a, it's a it's a model that people um, may may find um, useful. But uh, I think that we fully appreciate uh, that tension between um, behavioral health only. Um, responses right now. I think, uh, you know, not that long ago, people would have been um, very positive about a co-response model um, when uh, just the idea of moving it away from police-only responses. Um, today, um, we're much more interested in behavioral health-only responses as a society, um, and we're 100 percent um, in agreement with that, but do think that there is a continuum in this model um, for SAMHSA around the idea of um, unless special circumstances, we're talking about special circumstances where there is, um, you know, potentially violent situations or a crime is, is occurring or there's a, a, a victim at, at risk, um, et cetera. So I had a couple of questions. I mean, the one thing I'll say is that it's more than an important conversation. For those who are in the field, and as we know with Walter Wallace, it's a life or death conversation. That's the issue that we're dealing with right now. We are here in part because somebody died um, that should not have, who was suffering from mental health distress. We can go through and rewind the tapes and all of this kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, the conversation that we're having is about a life and death conversation. And for so many black and brown people, immigrant folks as well, um, as I know with Christian Hall, out you know with state police responses, um, this is more than just important. It's not a matter of policy. It is a matter of life and death. That being said, I do want to unpack a little bit because I think what we're not clear about actually is that there is a co-responder model in place, um, and that in fact it sounds like what we are doing is dispatching CIT trained police officers to a field. Um, and it's not clear at what point the clinically trained counterpart arrives at the scene and or is considered a first responder. That's, that's I think one core question. I'm not clear about the co and the co-responder model. I am clear that a CIT office, uh, an officer who has had some CIT training may arrive on the field. I do not actually believe that a CIT trained officer, even slightly de-escalated, even with time, is able to meet many of these needs as a clinician would, as I'm sure you understand, Dr. Bowen, you are a professional in the field, you have hours and hundreds and hundreds of hours of training, um, and you do not carry a, a gun, you know, you just, it's not an option for you. So you, um, you will automatically have to resort to other types of de-escalation strategies. So, you know, can can somebody clarify? Is there actually, when that nine one one call gets sent and there is a dispatch, can you promise that a CIT trained officer plus a clinically trained person are the first people to respond to the scene, or is it just a police officer, CIT trained or not, but a police officer? Uh, let me jump in there. First and foremost, this is a pilot program. There's only four teams. So I can't promise that a co-responding team will respond anywhere. I'd be very honest with you. Um, it's a pilot program to see how it's working. But you raised the, the point of direct dispatches. It was something we're, we're, we're trying to work out now. As it stands right now from a labor perspective, uh, just bear with me for a second. When I dispatch a call, two officers are assigned, and that's been our past practice. So we need to put two officers to an assignment. And the yeah. problem with the co-responder model is it's one police officer and a civilian. 
and that officer is responsible for the safety of the civilian in the vehicle. So we're trying to figure out what, what calls we can safely send a one officer assignment to without violating contract provisions. So we're going to need to work with the FOP on this one, um, but we're looking to see how we can identify those specific calls because when they come in, they come in in a very broad bucket, person screaming, person with a weapon, and trying to parse that out to figure out which bucket it should go into, CIT, direct uh, co-responder model, uh, the, uh, the crisis line, or to direct uh, dispatch to the mobile emergency team you know, in, in the future. So that's what we're trying to do. But as it stands right now, the officers are in the field. Um, they are responding proactively to the CRT-related calls. So they are showing up at the same time for a lot of the calls, now only in a very small part of the city, East Division and in Central right now, because there's only two teams. But they're, they're self-responding, and then they're being called in by other police officers at this point. But our goal is to find that niche that they can fall into where we can direct dispatch them safely without, you know, having the FOP uh, legitimately having concerns about officer safety. And, and we have that same, very same concern. Rachel, could you just clarify how much is the co-responder model roughly the allotment for it? Um, so for the, for the existing pilot or for the expansion? Both Com combination. What are, what are we looking? So the, if you, I can, I can pull that up, but I think, the approximately it's six million dollars. Um, that also includes staff for that's the full twenty four seven expansion plus the um, embedded navigation um, at the nine one one radio room. And I can parse those things out between them. Um, no I mean, okay. I think one of the questions, and you heard this right. The question is, is that you know the co responder model is first of all. I want to state for the record, I absolutely support officers, fully CIT trained officers. If we could have every single police officer have C full CIT training, if there's certification for it, I am fully in support of that. I think it's necessary. I think it's fantastic. You know, I think it's been uh, lo loudly promoted that we need to encourage our officers to get training in uh, not not just like things like minimum force, but actually alternatives, um, and 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 you know really work with people on de-escalation alternatives, you know all these types of things that I think have been largely promoted by you know Chief former former Philadelphia Police Chief Ramsey, for example, um, among many other uh, leading chiefs around uh, police chiefs around the nation. But I think, you know, what we're hearing is that, and Madam Chair, I hope, you know, after this, I'll, I'll kind of um, ask a, maybe one more question, but just, you know, to clarify again, um, the, the, thank you. <laughs> um, what, what we have is a, a mod, a co-responder name, not necessarily a model because we don't have enough in there. Um, and we cannot actually guarantee that there will be a co-responder, as I think um, Deputy Commissioner Healy, is that right? I'm sorry. I don't want to mess up your title. <laughs> um, so I apologize. Well, I'm, not, I'm not there yet. I'm just a staff inspector, ma'am. Okay, S Inspector Healy, Staff Inspector Healy. <laughs> I, I'm happy to, I know you're on a lot of these, so, you know, it's, uh, it's important that I get your title correct. Um, but I think, you know, and, and we're spending six million dollars for this, right? The question is, is that from the from the, you know, the the uh, treatment not trauma coalition, um, and what a lot of clinicians will say is that the money really needs to go into that expansion on the full on mobile crisis units. I think, um, you know, the the pilot nature of the um, uh, of the uh, you know the the so-called co-responder model is all the more reason why we should go in for a non-law enforcement response that could actually become more responsive. Um, and the problems that I think uh, Inspector Healy laid out about whether you know it violates the FOP contract, which you know like that's a whole complicated nature. It it encourages us to say that we should actually be doubling our efforts within the mobile crisis unit, rather than pursuing half measures or non-measures, I mean, not saying it's non, you know, cause I don't wanna denigrate some serious work that's going on into it around CIT trained officers, 
you know, uh, improvements on police dispatch, all of those things, absolutely 100% important. But, you know, the six million that has been allocated and the work through the MacArthur Foundation should really be around the development and expansion of the non-law enforcement response. Um, but, you know, I think this is, this is where, this is not just attention, it's actually feeling much more like we are potentially um, undermining some really good work that could be going on rather than what we could do, which is to take that money and actually double down on the non-law enforcement based response. And, you know, um, I don't know that that's going to be, you know, resolved. I'd be happy to hear some perspectives. I'd be interested in hearing the perspective of Dr. Bowen first. Um, and I also want to underscore that this absolutely does not want to say that I'm not investing on the police end because I do want to invest in police officers, expanded training, better police dispatching, um, the time that we spent with 911, uh, ensuring that we slow, you know, we slow things down, we de-escalate and calm people down 100%. But for people experiencing mental health, when it's a life or death issue that is at play, and we have seen this time and time again, we need to be doubling down on non-law enforcement responses. And this should be something that the MacArthur work should really be directing. We should not be pursuing things um, that you know are at odds with what SAMHSA is saying, with what uh, other cities around the country are leading on. I've had the opportunity to be part of the Justice Collaborative uh, for a year studying um, alternatives um, and mobile crisis units were among them, but serious alternatives. I'm worried and concerned that the city of Philadelphia is pursuing something when we have the other option here. And it's what SAMHSA uh, request, re requires or recommends um, and it's what other cities are leading on. And I don't think that we're at the leadership level if we're going to do something that's not uh, a law non-law enforcement response. So I'll let Dr. Bowen, I'm interested in, in um, Rachel uh, from the policy angle, and then of course, uh, Inspector Healy. So and I'll stop there, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Council Member, and I uh, I appreciate all that you have said, and um, also appreciate the passion um, behind it, which we share. Um, I think we're talking about um, compassionate response, um, and we're talking about um, appropriate response, and that's why the model has multiple um, options in it. But we are also exactly talking about doubling down on the community mobile response. I just want to be absolutely clear that we are very much um, in the lead or on the um, the forward edge of developing a community um, non-police mobile um, uh, response system in the city. And right now we have one 24-7 um, mobile response and one part-time mobile um, response. We are more than doubling uh, with the request for um, this year's uh, budget. And based on the, the calls, um, we do need to double down if we're going to have a, a robust and significant response that is community um, only response. And ultimately to have folks be calling directly into the PCL and not 911 at all. So we are in a transition of shifting from a, a fully 911 police response to a social service response. This is a big shift um, and we will need to evaluate and make some decisions along the way while we, while we do um, this response. Uh, I wanna say that we have been pushing out the PCL crisis line and communicating with folks that they can call directly. That's the 215-685-6440. Just taking that opportunity to put that out there. Um, right now, you alluded to a three number, um, the 988 that will be coming in um, in July of 2022. It's going to be statewide, um, and we do expect 
uh, already planning to implement that and for uh, to communicate that out widely and are hoping that we are able to make enough of a culture shift that when people have a mental um, health they're in distress for a mental health or behavioral health challenge that um, they can shift from 911 as sort of an automatic response to 988 as an automatic response. But for now, we are pushing out the 215-685-6440 because we understand the urgency and the importance of having a um, community mobile response. And we um, are uh, really looking forward to being able to increase the capacity of both that line to receive calls and the um, teams to respond to them on the ground. And that will take us a little bit of time to get there, but we are well on our way um, to having that be a significant uh, part of what is happening in Philadelphia. And just, um, you know, cities are hearing about that and are acknowledging that Philadelphia uh, is, um, is very much uh, in, in the forefront of developing that type of a robust community uh, mental health response. Yeah, and I mean, I'll add a couple of points uh, on top of Commissioner Bowen's, um, which is, I, you know, I think we also want to stress, we see the importance of the work with 911 and have been prioritizing in all of our collaborative work, you know, again, how to identify when calls can be uh, transferred away completely to the Philadelphia crisis line. That's something that, you know, we're working towards and we're hoping to be able to do such that the robust system that of mobile crisis units that the commissioner is, is building is kind of tied in intimately uh, enough that um, people can be responded to with the urgency that it requires. And, you know, Right now, people call 911 when there's an emergency, and we kind of have to recognize that and are kind of working within that infrastructure. I think we see uh, the co-responder program as a part of this larger culture shift, right? It's not designed to be, you know, just, we're just gonna send police with behavioral health and, you know, wipe our hands of that or wipe our hands of the work. Like we are, we're thinking about uh, it as a way to, shift um, sort of as police are going out to these instances the way they are now, really equipping them with the tools to de-escalate as, as Inspector Healy um, articulated. And, and again, that's going to take time. And so as we're going to learn a lot from doing the co-responder model um, about, you know, the ways in which, uh, you know, policing practices are going to change and the way these partnerships can really be advantageous. I don't think it's an alternative. I think it's, um, like I've been saying multiple times, like part of a larger continuum and part of the work ongoing is going to be like very carefully making sure that co-responders are going to the calls for which they are appropriate and not the ones where police aren't, you know, police don't need to be involved. That's part of the evaluation work. That's part of ongoing quality control that, you know, is, again, is going to, it's going to take us time to build those systems and to learn from, you know, this intervention and learn from the growth in the mobile crisis system. Um, if I could just jump in real quickly, I mean, sometimes I think the co-responder term is a little bit misleading. This is a much bigger, it's much like we're putting together a larger puzzle and co-responder is a piece of the puzzle, but everything's fitting together. We've been working and, and uh, Dr. Bowen has been talking about expanding the crisis response of mobile teams, I'm saying the mobile teams in collaboration in coordination with what we're doing. We've uh, got the mental health clinician that they've embedded into our police radio the whole mindset with the with the call script coming in, um, I'll be honest with you, we had debate and one of the, some of the last debates we've had is like one of the honest questions is, do you want police or do you want a mental health clinician? Um, and that's a very honest answer, but you can't put that out there if we don't have all the resources in place. So Commissioner Outlaw, that's one of the questions she would like in place. I believe DBH wants that in place as well, but we would need to make sure that, like I said, we're working as a team. So as when you call in and ask that, that we can actually fulfill that. And like I said, I don't think there's ever been a thought that co-responder is going to uh, replace anything. We're looking to augment all the existing services we have in tandem. 
And if that makes any sense. So the co-responder is a piece of a big puzzle, but the, the uh, mobile response seems to be very much a part of how can we get them dispatched from radio directly? That's been very much a part of this conversation. So it's not like we've excluded it in lieu of the co-responder. We're trying to figure out, like I said, certain calls should definitely go to a civilian uh, mobile response team. That question is, how do we identify those calls? And in the process of developing that, um, Dr. Bowen is actually developing the um, logistics. So is when we do get that in place, we flip that switch, we're gonna have enough people out there that can actually respond. The last thing we can have happen is, you know, okay, you need a, a medical health condition and it takes 24 hours to get there. That's not that's not helpful. So we just need to make sure we put all our, our ducks in a row. And I think as the doctor said, we're well along our way. So I just hope you just get the picture that it's not just co-responder. That's a piece of a bigger puzzle. And the, the mobile emergency teams have been a very much a part of it. The mental health clinician at uh, radio at the part. So we're all working together how we can direct these calls away from cops. And you asked for the police officer's perspective, and I'll give you mine. And I would love not to go to these calls. I would much rather handle it all. As long as it's safe enough, and I'm sure these people will be safe, uh, I'm happy to, to pass off these type of assignments because they do get complicated and they're drawn out, and I really don't like getting about them if I don't have to. I'd much rather be chasing bad guys. I mean, so the ability for DBH to step up and handle this uh, will be a win for the police department, I mean, and a win for the people of the city of Philadelphia. And I know that uh, Dr. Bowen is well on her way to making that a reality. So I don't want you to think that just we got everything invested, we're putting all our money in one bucket. Um, we're really not. It's spread across, and this is very much a part of what you just said with the crisis response teams is part of our plan. Is, is that correct, Commissioner? Yes. I think that, first of all, uh, Inspector Healy, that is actually very helpful, and I think it's a very clear... Um, I think it's a, it's it's a very realistic picture. I think the challenge with Rachel, especially as you're developing out the work on the policy end, is that we should see the co-responder model as a bridge that shrinks into a trans a full transition into um, you know a uh, uh, into the mobile crisis units, with the caveat that officers will continue to be trained in CIT. We will continue to invest in police dispatch um, supports on that end. We will continue to encourage officers uh, when, you know, at all times just to slow it down before we go in and, and to do all of that. Um, but what I think we're hearing is that we're not getting the clarity that uh, the co-responder model is the bridge that ultimately moves and transitions over into the mobile crisis, and that we need to see a rapid escalation of the mobile crisis units in a way that we would see with, say, like what we're doing with the Citizens Police Oversight Commission, right? So like the Citizens Police Oversight Commission starts with a $2 million effort, um, you know, starting in July but by it, within two years, it's at 13 million and 122 staff. Um, with that kind of oversight, um, I want to see if that's just on oversight and this is about meeting needs, we should be seeing numbers that are frankly multiples of that. Um, I think one council member who listened in on the, uh, on the briefing that we had with the Treatment Not Trauma Coalition said that they could use four mobile crisis teams in his own district alone. you know. And so it's that kind of thinking that we need to be getting to. And then the last thing that I'll just say for Rachel and for Dr. Uh, Bowen and, and also for Inspector Healy, we generally, one of our issues, and I agree with Inspector Healy, we can't actually like say that we're, do you want a mobile crisis unit or do you want the police to respond when we don't have the capacity certainly for the one, right? On the other hand, we tend to be a capacity, we tend to allocate things within Philadelphia based on our own agency capacity as opposed to what the actual need is. And so on Rachel's end one, and, and on Dr. Bowen and on Inspector Healy, and I know Inspector Healy already said this uh, because Commissioner Outlaw is committed to it, we must understand what the need is. We, can, we, we have to be careful that we can't promise to meet needs that we don't have capacity for. But we have to understand what people are asking for. So whatever measures we're putting in place to determine what are the calls that are clearly could, could actually be handled by a mobile crisis team, whether or not we have one in place. Um, that seems to be a singular mission of the MacArthur money. 
um, that because it's got to determine where our investments go and would probably have had a big influence on what we chose uh, to do with our monies now. Um, Madam Chair, I'm done, but you know, I think that we, it just underscores more that we need to put more money into the mobile crisis expansion and it's got to be seen as a rapid expansion of work um, beyond this year. This is not a pilot. This is not gonna be another pilot that we continue to do. Um, this has got to be a core function of uh, of the city because our communities uh, demand it and because people suffer horrible consequences when we don't do it. And um, I am I am done with my line of questioning, but I wanna thank these panelists uh, for engaging in this conversation. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Well, thank you so much, uh, Council Member, for your questions and uh, Council Member Thomas too. I think that, um, you know, well, listen, the purpose of our hearings is to investigate, is to get information and the, to make sure that the public has that information as well. And I think that thus far we've done a stellar job uh, of, of putting information out there, asking questions that are uh, pertinent and that we are hearing from our constituents that they want to know the answers to. And uh, moving forward, I agree that this is not something that's a uh, an experiment of some sort. This is not um, necessarily a pilot program. Um, this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, learning in real time, <laughs> you know. So we don't have the luxury of trying to say, well, this worked and we're going to try that in six months. And we're going to try that next year. And, you know, no, we, we need to be uh, on the ground because as we all know, Philadelphia has a significant mental health issue. And so addressing that issue is right here and right now in front of us. So, uh, so thank you to both of my colleagues for your questions today. Uh, we're going to move forward with the next panel. Madam Clerk, if you could call the next panel forward. The next panel includes Anthony Erase, Director of the Police Advisory Committee, and John F. White, Jr., President and CEO of the Consortium Incorporated. Hello. Fantastic, Hello. fantastic. Hello, how are you? I'm doing quite well, thank you. Good, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Is this John yes. White? Yes, it is. The, the legendary, thank you for, for joining John. us today. No, thank you, Councilwoman, and thank all the members of this committee and council as a whole for your attention uh, and uh, attentiveness to, to this all important issue. Uh, I, I would first like to really uh, congratulate Dr. Bowen uh, and her leadership team for taking such a bold step in bringing these changes about. Uh, I've listened intently to the testimony, and there are a couple of things from a provider's perspective that I would like, like to, to com comment on. The tragic and unnecessary death of Walter Wallace uh, has triggered a, a systemic change a systems change by what has been proposed by DBH. It was not just to respond to the immediate crisis and trying to reassure people of their safety, but these steps go a long ways towards trying to help prevent the next crisis. We keep calling it co-response. Someone whose agency has a mobile crisis unit the co-response um, is totally inappropriate. It's not a co-response. It is a crisis intervention team. And the key word is team. Yesterday, we received a call regarding a resident citizen who was going having a mental health crisis. The call came from the hotline. The dispatcher in triaging the call, heard the man say that he had a weapon. He was alone in his house. They contacted us and he contacted 911. When our team arrived, an officer was present. He allowed us to work with the young man in his home, got him to come outside, de-escalate the situation. That's teamwork. And that didn't involve the, the CIT, the CRT. It didn't involve them. This was a lone police officer. Why do I cite this as an example? The level of discernment that the dispatcher 
demonstrated is what needs to take place and what is going to have to take place within the police department's dispatcher unit. The notion that he made a determination that a mental health professional and law enforcement should pair to address this situation is unusual. In most cases, that dispatcher would have not contacted the mental health, the consortium, but would have only called 911. That level of discernment to be able to decide what is going to be in the best interest of that citizen has got to permeate everyone who gets involved with this response. And we don't talk about that. When, do, when does a 911 operator take a call about someone in crisis? Are they calling a mobile crisis unit? Or are they calling the crisis intervention team? In most cases, in most neighborhoods, your community behavioral health provider is very familiar with his patients, with their patients. Crisis intervention, the crisis intervention team, they don't have the kind of information. Remember, Mr. Wallace was one of our members. He had just visited with us three days before. We know him, and he knows us. That level of trust is important. So the, the necessity for coordination between the crisis intervention team and the local behavioral health provider is critical. And I have no doubt that as this a demonstration that they're about to enter in this program, that's got to be also in the top of thinking. Why do I say that this is a system change? There are two things that are embedded in the approach that Dr. Bowen is taking involving the dual responses that separate the Philadelphia model from every other co-responder model in any other major city. Number one, you're involving a peer specialist, someone from the community, familiar with the mores and attitudes, able to communicate with their neighbors, and a family resource person in recognition of the fact that while one individual in a household may be experiencing a crisis, everybody else in that household is experiencing a crisis as well. And you're following up with them under this model to see if they need any additional services. The CRIT has to know what services are available. They have to have a relationship with that local behavioral health provider or else it doesn't work. That has to be a smooth handoff from the uh, clinician on the team to the clinicians in another agency in order to continue to follow up and service that individual as well as that family. The other thing that separates Philadelphia from all the others, this approach is the first step towards preventing the next crisis. If we're able to intervene on the individual that is experiencing the crisis today, we mitigate those circumstances, we follow up with treatment, we check with him doing wellness checks to see how he's doing, to give him tips about how to better control his emotions. We are taking a giant step for that crisis of that individual not being repeated. So is there tension? There may be. But in this situation, there's no need because we are dependent on each other. It depends on the intellect and the discernment of the people that you have involved in this situation. The dispatcher did not have to call a mental health group. He could have just called 911. He did both. He did both. And we avoided a tragic situation and got someone the necessary treatment they so badly needed. So thank you. The 
Did you did you hear me? Well, I, absolutely, we did. Absolutely, okay. I want to thank you for that very compelling testimony, and for your wide range of experience and knowledge on this subject and issue, um, and and certainly as um, as it was mentioned earlier, the consortium is involved with assisting the city uh, in its uh, planning and programming. Uh, around this issue. So I, I thank you on so many different levels for all that you've done for this city. I mean, I think most people probably don't even have a clue as to the level of work that you've done to keep our city safe and to keep our people healthy. And so I, I just say simply thank you. And thank you. Uh, by the way, you know, I chaired this committee. Uh, <laughs> well, you, Have a good you well, I, I'm trying only to follow in your footsteps. Oh, sir. get out of here. No, 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 no. This, this is an extremely <laughs> important issue, and the degree of yeah. attention that you yeah. folks are paying to it. Uh, and Councilwoman Gim, you're absolutely right. Um, but those those are matters that ha where we have to demonstrate how strong we are when we come together and focus on this issue. There's a need for both of us. There really is. Thank you so much, Mr. White. Fantastic. Uh, we had another speaker who was on this panel. And I want to see if they are available and ready to testify. I'm available and ready to testify. Fantastic. And so that is Anthony. Irachi. Irachi. I didn't want to mess it up too badly. Okay. okay. Anthony, please. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Anthony Arachi. I'm with the Police Advisory Commission. And uh, for today, I wanted to say that uh, in Philadelphia, police response has traditionally been kind of a one-size-fits-all answer to calls for service. Uh, we're here discussing mobile crisis response units because collectively, we understand that one-size-fits-all does not work as a response when the diversity of calls includes critical incidents involving Philadelphia residents in crisis. The resolution we're discussing lists various models available to reimagine who responds to these crisis calls. These models include a community-based response, a co-response between police and mental health professionals, and a system where police can respond after a mental health professional has made an assessment. At this time last year, a co-responder model featuring a mental health professional and a law enforcement officer felt like a revolutionary idea for Philadelphia. The fact that other models are also on the table speaks to how committed the city is to listening to what residents are asking for as reforms are designed. At its root, the question of who, com who comprises a mobile response unit is inextricably linked to the question of community trust in police. The fact remains that some residents of Philadelphia do not trust the police. The work of the PAC is focused on incrementally building this trust, and we know it can't be rushed. While city leadership works to build this trust from different angles, it is critical that we all continue to listen when Philadelphians tell us how they want to receive service when they make the decision to call for help. The question at issue is this. Who do Philadelphians want to see when they call 911 for help when a mental health crisis arises? There's no single answer to this question, and the service the city provides should be based on a number of factors, including the historic relationship with police. The act of truly listening and building programs to be responsive to how residents want to receive service is a restorative approach and an act of reconciliation that the Police Advisory Commission supports. The PAC believes that the city can empower 911 to, to differentiate between calls that need law enforcement and those that don't, then pull from a diversity of mobile crisis response services that can be dispatched accordingly. Designing and employing multiple models of, multi of mobile crisis response to meet the diversity of resident needs not only provides better service, but also ensures that law enforcement is being utilized efficiently and effectively. Further, this would empower communities to request the type, of the type of response they need from 911, making them active participants in response efforts. The PAC is committed to this issue and stands ready to assist with planning and implementation if ever needed. 
thank you all today and I'm available for questions if there are any. Thank you much for your testimony. Do we have any questions for this uh, panel of witnesses from the members of the committee? Let's see. Oh, I see Council Member Gim has a brief comment. Yes, I just want, thank you so much, Madam Chair. I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, both uh, Mr. Arache and, uh, and of course, uh, the legendary Mr. White um, for your work. Um, and looking forward to uh, what what lies ahead, certainly for the Citizens Police Oversight Commission, but also the partnership that we're going to be developing. But I do want to just uh, make a, a, a comment, uh, particularly to Mr. White, just to thank him and the consortium for investing around the police dispatchers. As you know, our police dispatch unit is a, a civilian unit uh, uh, within the uh, city labor uh, unions. Um, they're very low paid, um, to say the least. Um, many of them are, uh, you know, for a while, we they were really laboring under significant and serious issues around overtime. Um, Council member, I don't know if you remember some of the hearings that we've had about with them that have been really very difficult. Um, I certainly do. And, um, you know, thanks to council member Bass, uh, council members um, on this body who are very concerned about our police dispatch unit and recognize that actually that first point of contact is so deeply important. We, we want to see this group of uh, civilians um, really supported. And so um, their healthcare matters, their mental health matters, um, their professional uh, training matters, um, their pay does matter as well. And I just wanna thank uh, Mr. White because oftentimes we dismiss uh, 911 and we get directly to uh, you know the individual officer and their interaction on the scene. But I think as Inspector Healy pointed out, uh, the dispatcher can do a lot to uh, shape the context in which an officer arrives at the scene can uh, encourage that officer to de-escalate or can express that serious urgency um, that's in place. So um, that's all I wanted to say. Just wanted to express my gratitude to this panel. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Thank you. I uh, could not agree with you more. And I wanted to also, uh, while we're on the subject, I did want to ask uh, regarding uh, the consortium and their involvement with the city um, just dialing back in my mind, I think early on, um, uh, well, actually, I'm just going, just going to come out and ask uh, Dr. Bowen if she could talk about the two providers under the consortium was one and there was another one and uh, what they were, the services, the level of services that they were providing for the city of Philadelphia. Dr. Bowen? Hello? Is there someone else from the administration who could possibly answer? Hi. Uh, I'm not able to answer the question, but I, I'll, I'm happy to be the point of contact to get you that information. Okay. Um, if we could uh, find out exactly, um, you know, the services that are provided, I think from what I heard, and actually maybe um, Mr. White could answer directly in terms of the services that are being provided from the consortium, because I, I thought that they were sort of in a lesser role, and I want to make sure that that's not the case uh, as a former Secretary of, of Human Services for the Commonwealth and also the uh, former chair of this committee and member of council that this is someone with a wide range and breadth of experience. So I just want to make sure that we're utilizing the services of the consortium in a way that totally, um, you know, connects and uh, is going to be good for the city of Philadelphia. So I don't, I, I don't want um, to uh, see them take in sort of second shift, if you know what I mean. We, we would like to see um, you know, the, the uh, consortium used in a very robust way because we know that they have the experience. I'm sure the other group does as well, but I'm just speaking of the consortium because it came 
uh, to my uh, mind that they were not in the same role, but sort of taking a second secondary can you, role. Can you hear me? Um, Council? I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if my video is on. It's it's uh, acting a little no. funny right now, but um, absolutely 100%. Um, the consortium would be playing a, a major role already, uh, working to get them up to uh, expanded, um, expanding their their current um, capacity and to get to a full time 24/7 and uh, managing uh, one of the, the regions. Their approach um, is um, an excellent one in much of the model um, mm -hmm. that we're, we're building is based on um, their, ex their experience and their approach, which is a very community-based approach um, and one that we embrace fully. So there is no question that... Um... Oh, I think we lost Dr. Bowen again. Okay. All right. So we'll 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 come back to um, that response. We'll hopefully she'll be able to. Oh, here she is. Um, I what's going on with my tech tech right now? Okay. But um, I think that you heard me um, in saying that they are. Okay. So you know what? Um, I know that Dr. Bowman is having some technical difficulties. So we're, I, this, I, but I, it's I, okay. I, I'm back, and I just want to reiterate that yes, they are a major partner in this endeavor, 100%. So um, I want to assure you of that, and that moving forward and develop a learning, developing a learning collaborative, they, they will be a major partner to make sure that there's consistency across the way in which the mobile teams are, ro are rolled out. Very good. Thank you so much, Dr. Bowen. Thank you. Uh, if we could have the clerk now call forward the next panel, panel number three to speak. Panel three includes Chris Henderson, Executive Director of Amistad Law Project, Nikki Grant, the Policy Director of the Amistad Law Project, and Annette Day, President of the Pennsylvania Society for Clinical Social Work. Fantastic. And if we could start with Chris Henderson, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Chris Henderson. Uh, I'm the executive director of Amistad Law Project. Thank you, Chairperson Bass, for your leadership on this issue. And thank you, members of City Council, uh, for the opportunity to, pro to provide testimony on why Philadelphians deserve more robust mental health services. Interrupting Criminalization recently released a report called Defund the Police, Invest in Community Care, a guide to non-police mental health crisis response. I'm going to share some information from that report. Since 2015, over 6,000 people have been shot and killed by the police, averaging around 1,000 per year. Of those 6,000, close to 1,500, or almost one in four, 23%, were people who were, or were perceived to be, experiencing a mental health crisis. With that figure rising to 39% in small or mid-sized metropolitan areas. Of these killings, over 42% were of Black and Latinx people. A person with unmet mental health needs is 16 times more likely to be killed by the police. These alarming figures do not reflect the mass incarceration of people with mental and cognitive disabilities and unmet health needs locked up in jails and prisons, conservatively estimated at bookings numbering 2 million per year. In psychiatric institutions, in emergency rooms, homeless slash houseless in the streets, and dying by suicide or overdose every day. People with unmet health needs are more likely to be killed by police, not because they are more violent, but because police should not be responding to those who are experiencing mental health crises. We need better systems. The reason millions of people across the country rose up and demanded cities defund the police is because our communities desperately need resources and municipalities say again and again that we cannot afford things like violence interrupter programs, job training programs, longer recreation center hours, and health care for all. Philadelphia must tax the rich. Philadelphia must reduce the police department budget. We must divert the $6 million currently earmarked for the co-responder program to mental health services around the city. The $7 million allocated for an expansion of the mobile crisis units is a start, but it is not enough. People should be able to call 911 for a loved one experiencing a mental health crisis. 
we should also be able to access mental health services on a regular basis and be able to maintain that care over time. What if there were drop-in counseling centers across the city? What if there was no wait time to see a therapist and when they can access those services? We keep responding to crises with bandwidth. The Chris, we can barely hear you. You're going oh, in and out. Is it going in and out? Okay. Is it better now? It's a little bit better now. Okay. Uh, we keep responding to crises with Band-Aids, the murder of Walter Wallace Jr. with an expansion of the co-responder model, an epidemic of gun violence with a police surveillance program called Group Violence Intervention. Philadelphians deserve better. Programs and services across the city have been divested from and defunded for decades. We deserve care and robust support in every neighborhood of the city. We can be a city that prioritizes the mental health of every Philadelphian. Council, divert the co-responder funding and expand mental health resources across the city. And I'm available if anybody has any questions after this. Thank you so much for your very powerful testimony. And uh, I think you bring up a lot of very valid points. Um, and uh, it, it, as I mentioned at the beginning of this hearing, we really think about policing and mental health in the intersection uh, of those two very differently today than we did just you know, a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And I think that that's progress, but I think the progress needs to be picked up significantly. And that's why we're all here. And I thank you for being here and for your testimony today and to continue that conversation. If we could have the next speaker testifying, Nikki Grant Esquire, I believe. <clears throat> Is Nikki Grant available? And if not, we'll hear from Annette Dyg from uh, the Pennsylvania, the president of the Pennsylvania Society for Clinical Social Work. Is Annette available? Yes, but I do see that Nikki's also available, but I think her sound isn't working. <laughs> okay, um, well, why don't we why don't we start with you, Annette, and then hopefully. Uh, Nikki, you can uh, get your sound together when, by the time Annette finishes and we'll come back to you. Okay, so Annette, please state your name for the record and let's proceed with your testimony. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Annette Day. <laughs> thank you. My name is Annette Day. Um, good afternoon, Philadelphia City Council and members of the public. Thank you to Councilwoman Bass and her team for allowing me to, tes to provide testimony today. I'm an outpatient therapist with the Family Practice and Counseling Network, president of the Pennsylvania Society for Clinical Social Work, and member of the Philadelphia Treatment Not Trauma Coalition, the group that Councilwoman Gim mentioned earlier. Thank you, Councilwoman Gim. Thank you, uh, yes, for your passion and for your dedication to treatment and not trauma. So I have 20 years of experience in the social services field in my various roles, including as a therapist for vulnerable populations, as a leader for more than 700 clinical social workers providing services to those who are vulnerable, as well as a survivor of trauma myself, I know what it means to be escalated when one is already in a precarious position. It's not an ideal state to be in. No one wants to be in that position, and no one who at their core wants to help those who need it most wants to witness people having to be in that position. By the very essence of their duties, be it even in cases through no fault of their own, police presence during a mental health crisis situation does not de-escalate, but rather escalates the situation for the person in crisis. Imagine if you were that person in crisis. Try to picture it. You are already disoriented, in a heightened state of alert, most likely scared, and then the police come. Even if you don't hear sirens or see a uniform, after all, the police presence is to assert authority, right? That's why they, then that's what they will be there to do in one way or another. And so I don't know, maybe you can, maybe you can't picture it. It actually may be easier to imagine if you're a black or brown person. I can't even begin to tell you how, especially after seeing so many of us from black and brown communities get tragically killed by police, how I tense up when I just happen to hear police sirens going past me now how I wonder what situation is warranted in the police call in the first place. The people in crisis 
are the ones who we should be thinking about calming down or de-escalating, not police. Clearly, folks in crisis don't have nearly as much support as police. And I think about even as a clinician, how I don't feel safe now with the police. And riding with them in a car, thinking that either myself or another clinician like myself, that anyone, especially someone in a mental health crisis, would not be even more fearful with a police presence, knowing full well that they have the ability to take any one of us out in any given moment. There's no way that that's doing what's needed, which is de-escalating the crisis. Us mental health clinicians, this is what we are trained to do, what we willingly sign up to do. And I want to note that the CIT program for police officers in Philadelphia is voluntary for the police officers. Not all police officers, as we have seen and as alluded to earlier, have the discernment necessary to not harm a person in crisis. Many times, in actuality, police officers will view people in crisis as threats. Us clinicians, we spent years some of us would even say blood, sweat, and tears being trained in de-escalation tactics. This is what we do. This is how we help people in crisis to heal and to promote long-term wellness. So please, in closing, City Council, DBH IDS, Councilwoman Bass, I'm asking with a sincere heart, please take another look. Not all calls to 911 need the police dispersed. Frankly, we need another three-digit number, which I know is being worked on. Funding should be diverted from the co-responder model to further expand mobile crisis units. Co-response is still a police response. Thank you. And I'm, and I'm also available for questions. Well, thank you so much for your testimony and for your experience. I see a question. Uh, there is a question from Councilman O. Councilman, I'm going to ask that you hold that question, if you can, for just a moment, and we're going to see if we can get our last witness to testify, and that is Nikki Grant Esquire. Nikki, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Please state no, your name no. for the record and proceed. My name is Nikki Grant. I'm the policy director at Amistad Law Project. I want to thank the chair of this committee, um, Chairman Chairman Bass for convening today's hearing on this important issue. After the tragic, tragic murder, murder of Walter Wallace Jr. by police on October 26, 2020, I also had the privilege of meeting several West and Southwest Philadelphia based social workers and nurses who saw in Mr. Wallace their own clients and neighbors. We came together to form the Treatment Not Trauma Coalition to fight to ensure that what happened to Mr. Wallace never happens to another Philadelphian. Yes. You've heard testimony today about how the Correspondent Pilot Program, also known as Crisis Intervention Response Teams, or CIRT. You've heard testimony and argument that police correspondents are a step in the right direction. I want to urge this body to consider that, but that what CIRT actually represents is a further entrenchment of law enforcement in a place that law enforcement has no business being in for the sake of maintaining the status quo. The implication behind a, a continuum of care that includes a co-responder model is that there are some people experiencing mental crises who are violent. We reject this framing. We have seen time and time again what happens when a black or bland brown person are in crisis. We are called violent and our murders are by law enforcement are deemed justified. This is why we cannot allow a co-responder program to continue in Philadelphia. Cops are not healers. We believe that the city can and should do better for its residents by not continuing to invest in a police response to mental health crises. What we have been seeing across the country in cities that have both a police and armed police res response, such as the STAR program in Denver, is that even though a non-police mental health responder program is having excellent results, it is undermined by having the overwhelming number of calls that could be going to a non-police response instead being routed to the co-responder. I'm going to quote from the I'm gonna, uh, uh, article. During the initial six-month period, police received 95,000 calls, 2,500 of which fell into the star scope of operation. How, however, only 743 calls were actually routed to STAR, representing under 3% of all police calls. Um, by comparison, the Hakuts program in Oregon 
responds to 70% of all calls. Um, we support DBH ideas as proposed expansion of mobile crisis teams and believe that this program will save lives. However, in order for community mobile crisis units to succeed, we must allow them to actually be the first responders responding to all mental health calls. The fact of the matter is that Philadelphia and many cities around the country have systematically defunded mental health services while allowing budgets for the program to obs obscene amounts. This isn't about um, who shows up in the emergency. About the persistent underfunding of basic what people need when, before there is a crisis. I urge the city to not go forward with police correspondents and instead invest that money in the vital mental health services our communities need. Um, thank you, and I can be available for questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I see that David, oh, Councilman, oh, are you still there? I know that he had a question, but then he had to withdraw his question. Uh, because I think he had to leave. Um, so, uh, Councilwoman Gim has a brief comment. Councilwoman yes. Gim. Thank you so much. I just want to thank uh, this panel um, for your tremendous work um, on leading a real effort to help us think about uh, mental health policing and, and public safety. Um, this coalition, uh, Madam Chair, has been meeting since, as you know, uh, since uh, Walter Wallace's uh, murder. And, um, you know, he, uh, they, they are driven first and foremost by uh, their expertise and um, their clinical backgrounds um, and about, uh, you know, a real vision for public safety and, I look forward to continuing to partner with them through this budget cycle. So I just wanted to say and express my thanks and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, I think that uh, seeing that there's no additional questions for this panel, uh, I believe that the technical staff needs to uh, briefly go into a recess to bring on uh, additional folks who would like to make public comment. Is that accurate, technical staff folks? Yes, it is, Madam Chair. Okay, so we should be on pause for how long, roughly? I would say about two to three minutes. Okay, so we'll just be on pause. We'll be here as soon as you're ready. You'll let us know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for calling Philadelphia City Council. A beeping noise will indicate when you are on the show with the host. In the meantime, enjoy this music. Hi, Modesto, are you in? Hi, Lonnie. Yes, I can hear you. All right, give me one second here. I'm just finishing up. Um, give me one second. Okay, great. Thank you.
Okay, Modesto, I, I think we are ready to go. Again, um, those who are called into public comment, please uh, turn down your TV or your live stream that you're listening to, and uh, you'll be able to hear the, um, the hearings through the phone. At the point that your uh, name is called, I will unmute you. You will hear a loud beep, and then you will be live in the session. And if your uh, call drops, us, please call back the number, and that uh, will get you back in the queue. Okay, Modesto. Okay, great. Thank you, Lonnie. Hey, Madam Chair, we are ready to go on our side. I just need to uh, touch base with Channel 64 to start the live broadcast. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, Council members and participants, we are live. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, Modesto. And if we can have Madam Clerk, please call the first group of uh, testifiers forward. The first group of testifiers are Julia Lyon, Annette Day, and Dolan Neefsi. I think we heard from Annette Day. Uh, yeah, we heard from Annette Day. So um, you could call someone else in Annette's place. Leslie Stickler. Okay. All right. And if your name was just called in that order, if you could please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can hear you very well. Hello. My name is Julia Lyon. Um, I am a social worker and a clinician and therapist. Um, so I would like to begin by emphasizing that the discussion we're having today about mobile crisis units and police involvement is primarily an issue of racial justice. We are constantly seeing on the media videos of police violence against black and brown people. Because of white supremacy and racialized trauma, police officers, like most of us, are likely to perceive the behavior of black and brown bodies as threatening when they respond on a call. Um, police also are armed um, and are trained to operate in a military manner. You combine this with the trauma that they experience on a day-to-day -day basis in their work, and this is a formula for violence when police respond to calls of mental health emergencies. I know the CRT or co-responder model is tempting as it seems like a reasonable compromise between calls for abolition of police and calls for support of police. However, this is a false compromise. It's a subversion of efforts to protect people of color and it rests on the assumption that police presence is necessary at the scene when people are experiencing the symptoms of mental illness because those people are inherently more dangerous or violent than others, which is absolutely not true. The co-responder model might look successful in research because in the research that's been done, it's solely been compared to police-only responses. And those police-only responses are often a disaster. Research shows that the less police involvement there is, the better the outcome for the individual being served. And trainings like CIT, which have existed for over 20 years, have not led to a reduction in violence. I ask that you please fund mobile crisis units fully and not a co-responder model. I ask that you please trust the science, the research, the mental health community consensus, the recommendations of the federal government, and most importantly, the voices of people of color. Please value the lives of people who are in the most vulnerable moments of their lives and offer them treatment, not trauma, care, and not cops. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. If we can have the next speaker state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, can you hear me? This is Leslie. We can Stickler. hear you well, yes. Thank you. State, um, state your name and begin, yes. My name is Leslie Stickler. Um, I, yeah, agree completely with Julia's statement. Um, I believe strongly police should not be involved in response to mental health crisis because they're not equipped to de-escalate emotional distress 
And this has been proven over and over again. Um, adding a clinician to the situation doesn't change the dynamics of a police response. And I am confused at best by the idea that the clinician leads the response when the um, co-responder model is based on having the teams work out of the regional operating centers of police, arrive in unmarked police cars, where a police officer literally gets out first, leading and engaging, and then deciding whether or not it's safe for the clinician to engage. Um, that doesn't sound like a uh, mental health led response to me. Um, mobile crisis units need to be accessible via 911 to be able to respond immediately like police do and to provide actual on-site services for de-escalation and connection with appropriate services rather than information and referrals, which don't really help people in crisis who are you know, in an emotional state of high activation um, where they're really, they need soothing and de-escalation, not a web of uh, service systems to try to navigate independently. Please divert funding from the co-responder model to further expand mobile crisis units. Thank you. And thank you for your testimony today. If we could have the next witness, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, hi, hello. My name is Dolan Nitsi. Uh, can you all hear me okay? I can barely hear you. Can you speak up at all? I'm having difficulty hearing you. Can, can you hear me better now? That's better. That is better. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, I think uh, some people before me have probably said it more eloquently than I can, but um, I, I just want to say thank you to the to the members for for seeing the importance of this issue and, and taking the time to address it. I would like to see Philadelphia be on the cutting edge of this because I think this is the right thing to do. Um, you know, having funding diverted from the co-responder co model to expand mobile crisis is is really no skin off anyone's back it's just changing the the methodology of how we do things and and it's better it's better for for the the citizens of philadelphia and it's better for the police officers so um i really hope that that we can make this happen and and get the mobile crisis units in place and get the right people um you know who can who can talk to the importance of this work and 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 help the help the the citizens and and the people in Philadelphia in, in a new innovative way that, you know, let other cities follow our model. So I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the time. Thank you for your time and for your testimony today and for listening to the hearing. We really appreciate that. Um, and if we could have our next panelist state your name for the record and proceed. Do we have another panelist here to speak? Okay, we might. The, ne uh, mm -hmm. the next panelists are Dana Shamor, Amanda Garland, and Sterling Johnson. Okay. And in that order, if you could state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Dana Sharmoy. Um, I'm a child and family therapist at Family Practice and Counseling Network. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. I have been working in the community mental health for 11 years. In working with the community, I've heard countless stories of community members experiencing trauma with law enforcement. All their fears were reinforced with the murder of Walter Wallace Jr. Not only did this show that police are not equipped to deal with mental health crisis situations, but their arrival leads to escalation and can result in the death of the person who was in distress and in need of help. We must provide a model that provides de-escalation, assessment, connection with resources, and an appropriate level of care, and making sure that we follow up to make sure the individual has secured the services needed without falling through the money cracks. Co-response is still a police response. 
funding should be diverted from the co-responder model to further expand mobile crisis units. This model is more in line with the best practice and will serve better for our communities. Mobile crisis units need to be easily accessible, which is why community members should be able to access mobile crisis through 911. I've had the opportunity to work in different settings the most effective settings are those with collaboration and holistic care. This is why the team should be, consist of an experienced licensed mental health clinician, a nurse or EMT, and a peer specialist. In order to provide the appropriate level of care, mobile crisis should also be able to provide transportation to wherever other services are required. I'm hopeful that together we can develop a model that best serves the community and increase access to care to those in crisis. We owe it to the community to create safety and support when they are most vulnerable. We need to make a commitment that when a family member calls because they need help for someone they love, they do not avoid calling because they fear what would happen to Walter Wallace Jr. could happen to their loved one. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, and the next witness in this panel, I forget how you state your name for the record and begin with your testimony. Hi, Council. My name is Amanda Garland. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. I oversee behavioral health providers and FQHCs in Philadelphia and provide consultation for behavioral health providers and other FQHCs and health centers outside of my own organization. We have often tried to call mobile crisis to come to our health centers in order to help transport patients to crisis response centers or to go to patients' houses or locations to get the help they are looking for and need to stabilize their mental health in a safe environment. We have waited hours for a team to come out or have been told that we should call 911 because they would not be available in a reasonable amount of time. This is also for patients with depression and suicidality. It does not include our patients who are having psychiatric emergencies outside of suicidality, which unfortunately we have always needed to resort to 911 because mobile crisis has told us they cannot transport patients who are having psychosis. Since COVID, we've been using phones a lot more, which has increased reach, but this reach has also led to calls being dropped where there was a high risk patient that needed a safety check for suicidality. I've called mental health delegates office and was told that I need to call 911 because mobile crisis is not allowed to do safety checks because they cannot enter homes if needed. I don't blame mobile crisis teams for redirecting us to 911 because they are beyond under-resourced. If they cannot check in on people who are in danger, transport people for various reasons or concerns, then there's a huge gap in the ability for mobile crisis to actually be helpful. Four teams will not be enough to respond to crisis in that time, in a time that a mental health emergency response requires. There also needs to be a way for them to transport all Philadelphia residents in any mental state they are in. There also needs to be a transparent process to provide feedback in regards to the mobile crisis teams to make sure there is trauma-informed treatment being given at assessments and within transports. I've received very mixed feedback on teams in the past when they were able to come out and had, have had to jump through hoops to provide any sort of feedback to improve services. I do not understand the barrier to currently rerouting 911 calls to mobile crisis so that residents that don't know that number would be rerouted automatically. Making, let's make the mobile crisis system work. Make one system actually work instead of having two lackluster systems of mobile crisis and co-responder program. As others have said, I'm concerned about the co-responder program because just the uniform alone is going to escalate a situation based on the traumatic history and the traumatic present between Philadelphia residents and police. I have de-escalated multiple situations over the years. I have never needed or wanted a weapon. I have de-escalated people who have had weapons on their body and have still never needed or wanted a weapon. I've also, over my 10 years in the field, only had to file one 302 for one patient because the mobile type crisis team refused to transport and reported that they felt the patient needed it because she was too aggressive, even though she had just waited three hours in order to be transported to crisis for help she was asking for. The majority of mental health crises can be de-escalated, quickly building rapport by truly listening. The person is asking for help. So we need a way to safely transport any resident from any location in any condition to the help that they are wanting and needing. We need to spend all of that money to actually make our mobile crisis system work and allocate money to increasing mental health supports and services. So after inpatient treatment or even after assessment, there are actually mental health resources for Philadelphia residents, no matter what insurance or income to immediately connect with. So we can reduce mental health emergencies to begin with and save our residents lives. This is life or death. Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony today. I agree it is life or death. 
Um, can we have our next person state your name for the record and proceed? Is not on the line. I'm sorry. Uh, Sterling is not on the line. Okay. Um, do we have other uh, testifiers today? The next panel is Rin Cap, Aaron Wilson, and Joel McIntosh. Okay. If we can have uh, those folks state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Hello, this is Rin Cop. And as you know, we're in the midst of a mental health crisis. I'm a mental health clinician experiencing this firsthand. The issue of inadequate behavioral health support in emergency situations is not new, but it's all the more critical and important now. It's vital that we invest in mental health services broadly and especially in emergency care. I've been listening to the conversation about co-response versus behavioral only. Um, and I want to share an example that can illustrate the importance of having a strong behavioral only response. As Annette said earlier, co-response is still a police response. My ethics code requires that I first do no harm, but when an individual needs hospital services and they have no ride, uh, the police are often involved as Amanda Garland beautifully highlighted. This leads to a worsening of the very shame, guilt, and fear that the person is already experiencing. It essentially makes the situation worse. The police presence often implies that someone broke a law or committed a crime, and to many people of color, it represents death and murder. The police presence simply worsens an already difficult situation, and it's my only option. No matter how much training the police officers had, the presence still would not be as good as behavioral-only options. It can be de-escalated easily with often with training and with support, with active listening, and behavioral health clinicians know how to do this. So thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Uh, if we could have the next witness, please come forward, state your name for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, my name is Joel McIntosh. I'm the director of a team of behavioral health consultants uh, that provide on-demand behavioral health services at the city of Philadelphia Health Department Health Centers. So currently, during the pandemic, our behavioral health consultants have responded to the increased needs of mental health services of our patients, which has often included mental health crises. It is clear to us that the current mental health system is overwhelmed, lack of service availability, has led to more likelihood that our patients will go into mental health crisis. And we've needed to contact the mental health unit, uh, mobile crisis response team. There's often been an extended wait time, sometimes for hours. There've been instances where the unit has simply not arrived before our clinic closes, a problem which has actually preceded the pandemic. This is simply not adequate for an individual who is experiencing mental health crisis. Further, our experience is that mobile crisis response teams are in need of more training. On several separate occasions, my team members and I have been disappointed by the lack of professionalism and clinical skill demonstrated by the mental mobile crisis response team staff. On, on one occasion, uh, one of my team members was particularly surprised at the coldness that was displayed, leading us to believe that there was likely a high amount of burnout within the team um, and feeling stretched beyond their capacity to provide compassionate care. On another occasion, the mobile crisis response team refused to transport a member that we had already assessed that the individual was not in the current crisis. We were told that the mobile crisis response team had already tr transported the individual too frequently, frequently to the CRC, insisting involuntary commitment was needed through a police and that we should contact 911. Thankfully, in this instance, the police was actually able to escort the individual to the CRC where they received help, but we did not believe that the police department is the resource that we should be using to access uh, support and transportation for these individuals. It's clear that our current mental health system is not robust enough and we need more mental health training um, for individuals responding, responding to these type of crises. Also, the current uh, amount of mobile crisis response team is not sufficient, and it's uh, been appreciated by myself um, to learn that the, of the efforts that there is to expand this, but um, I 
really would like to see more of those mobile crisis response teams available to the individuals of our city. Thank you very much. And thank you for your testimony and insight. If we have our next panelist teed up and ready, please state your name for the record and proceed. Next year, Aaron. Aaron. Okay. Our next panelist, are you ready? Please state your name for the record and proceed. If Aaron Wilson is on the next panel, we can move to. Okay, we can move forward. We can move to Steven Strauss. Yes. Um, my name is Steven Strauss. I'm with the Real Community Safety Team of Power Live Free, a group of 50 religious congregations across the city committed to racial and social justice. And I thank you for holding this hearing. Our behavioral health system is broken. There is no more dramatic proof than the fact that our jails and prisons are teeming with mentally ill and intellectually and developmentally disabled people who are warehoused rather than treated and supported. Unsurprisingly then, police, not crisis counselors, are the typical first responders to people suffering breakdowns. The result has been widespread tragedy. Every major city and countless smaller communities across our nation can list tragic cases of people in breakdown who have lost their lives at the hands of the police. And whether police receive crisis intervention team training or use some other training regimen does not seem to matter. At this point, it is beyond dispute that armed authority figures and people in behavioral health crises are a dangerous mix. Last October 26, Philadelphians witnessed the killing of Walter Wallace Jr., who was having an episode. He was known to the PPD as someone with serious behavioral health issues. His community mental health care provider, the consortium, could have been called. There was a far brighter scenario for Mr. Wallace, but it didn't happen. The contrast between armed police barking orders to someone already in distress and a crisis team of a medic and clinician and or peer specialist whose jobs are to de-escalate and support could not be greater. Innovation in this field isn't a dream anymore. It's happening now across the country based on a model that's been in use in Eugene, Oregon for, for 30 years. Cities as different as San Francisco, Los Angeles, Denver, Portland, Oregon, and New York City are moving rapidly to civilian-based crisis response. De-escalation and service Do you, so do you want to finish your statement? I appreciate it. De-escalation and service combined with case management anchor these programs. It's time that Philadelphia catch up. We appreciate the strides um, that have been made since Walter Wallace, but we've got to go further, as others have said. Um, and, and there are built-in obstacles uh, to the co-responder model. Take, for example, the security requirement that to drop off someone to a crisis center, co-responder teams first have to shackle and cuff them before entering the vehicle. If that's not a recipe to incite fear and violence, I don't know what is. The city should reconsider expanding its co-responder program and use all that it has learned to move to the civilian model. The realms of public safety and behavioral health are in a paradigm shift now. Uh, paradigm okay. shift and should be embraced. Okay, um, at the very least, uh, get a quality pilot program that we can test up and running here and now. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you very much. Next, we have Kelly Jude. Kelly, are Kelly you here? Kelly is not on the line. I'm sorry, Kelly's not on the line, but the remaining uh, uh, public commenters are. Next, we have Lauren Alden. Hear me? 
Hi, this is Lauren. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I'm speaking in regards to resolution 210459. I, um, I work for Liberty Resources, which is a cross-disability organization that advocates and assists people with disabilities to live their best life in the community. My team and I have worked with consumers who have required the assistance of the Philadelphia Mobile Crisis Unit and others who are seeking mental health support. We have numerous consumers who desperately need consistent behavioral and mental health case management and just can't get it. We've worked with consumers needing emergency crisis response and have and have the mobile team not make it out or make it hours later or state the individual is not enough of a harm risk to themselves. We've also seen consumers bounce around from cop car to psych unit with no guidance upon discharge and no follow-up on services. I have coworkers who are not mental health caseworkers acting as if they are. They are checking in weekly with these folks, providing peer support and information and referral services, the staff are constantly trying to navigate the CVH and DBH IDS system and avoid any PPD involvement. As social service workers, we can tell you firsthand that our city is not properly helping our residents who need mental health care. Many other major cities have already shown that a well-trained and funded group of mental health professionals drastically reduces the need for law enforcement and can immediately get a person the help and support they need that can otherwise take years to get when bounced around from cop car to hospital, et cetera. I'd like to give two quick examples of consumers who would greatly benefit from a better mental health crisis response process by the city. I'm changing their names for the purpose of this testimony. Herman was going through a mental health crisis. His family was concerned about him and they called the cops. Although Herman was eventually able to get the mental health help that he needed, he does not share the story from that day about his mental health recovery. Instead, he speaks about how the cops tackled him to the ground and assaulted him. As Herman's advocate, we know he would have had a better experience to recovery if a well-trained crisis response team worked with him. Another consumer named Bob has paranoia and hoarding tendencies. Bob has called the police on numerous occasions. The police visit Bob's house, do a welfare check on him, and leave. When Bob feels as if he's having a heart attack, which is actually a panic attack, Bob goes to the hospital and spends the night there. Bob is finally receiving some services through CBH as in terms of medication management. He's doing a bit better, but he still experiences many manic episodes and is not able to recognize when he's having a panic attack. Bob needs consistent mental and behavioral health case management and not a never ending cycle of police visiting his apartment. We are asking the city for a fully funded, professionalized mobile crisis response that can be that can de-escalate a situation and not involve law enforcement. The law enforcement are not adequately trained in de-escalation, and it is not fair to them, and certainly not fair to folks seeking help to have them handle these situations. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you for being here today and for your patience and speaking. And while we have it, actually, shout out to Liberty Resources and Lisa Jackson, uh, who does a tremendous job over there, and you as well. Thank you so much for being here. We could have the next witness. State your name for the record and proceed. Next, we have D.D. Risher. Can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can hear you well. Okay, great. Um, my name is D.D. Risher. I'm uh, Councilman Bass. I'm in your district. I also work on site in a 24-hour women's safe haven down in Center City. I'm actually calling you from work, and I haven't heard all the hearings because of traveling to work. But I just want to put some real life experience. We work with um, women who have experienced the lived experience of homelessness and who have mental health issues, um, and we have had to uh, call um, for support, and so we've had to call the police. Uh, three times in the last week, which is not that common that we call that often, um, it's, it's, it just illuminates the problem. We completely need a mobile mental health crisis unit, not a co-responder unit. And just to give a real-life story from last night, the police were called. They were very, very rough with the woman who had escalated. And it traumatized a number of residents here, and we've been trying to calm them all day long. 
You never know who's going to come. Men are triggering. Uniforms are triggering. Uh, white policemen are triggering, and policemen are triggering. Often these are women who've lived, lived their entire lives in contexts of violence. Um, and so to send a police um, contingent in or a policeman in these situations is is I, I'm trying to find the word. It is the opposite of what's needed, and this feels like um, a funding decision we should have made. It, it should have been doing for 15 years. It seems almost like a no-brainer to have these hearings. You're, so many specialists are saying this. I can't even think of the argument for having a co-respondent, a team. To have an independent mobile crisis team, especially with a peer specialist, that will make such a difference. Um, it's just critical. And I'm just saying that on the ground every day. We try not to call the police. We do everything we can not to have to do that. And when we do, we are always stealing ourselves uh, for what's going to happen. How will the team interact with the women? And like if something happens like last night, you feel horrible. I mean, I wasn't here last night, but I know that mood's here. So, um, and the second thing I want to say is I don't understand why in the world, as Amanda Garland said, we would ever have a 988 number to dial differently from a 911 number and why we couldn't have a seamless system where 911's called and the independent mobile crisis unit is mobilized immediately from 911. We got to keep it simple. These are best practices everywhere. Philadelphia can do this and should be doing this. And to do anything different, to not make, if we have to do the co responder the transition, fine. Make it as quick as possible. Thank you for your time. This is really a very urgent issue, and thank you. Uh, Representative Bass for introducing um, the resolution. Well, absolutely, and thank you for your patience and for staying with us today and for your very powerful testimony. Thank you. Uh, if we can have Madam Clerk call the next witness forward to testify. Next is Jacqueline Odour. Hello? Hi, Jacqueline. Are you, are you here? Can you hear us? Perfectly. I can hear you perfectly. My name is Great. Jacqueline Please state Odour. your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Jacqueline O'Dor. I am a licensed clinical social worker. I have been working in Philadelphia and Montgomery County for the past 16 years. So what I, my major concern was the amount of social workers or case managers who would be available for this project. Um, the, the, the CBH, the Community Behavioral Health Association, had a meeting last week and on the 13th, May 13th. And they were saying, you know, we don't even, we don't have enough behavioral health providers to even support the system that we're in. So it's, it's kind of a, like a bittersweet moment that we're going through is like people want to take care of themselves, which is awesome, you know? And then the other hand is like, we don't have enough people. So I appreciate this model that's coming, um, Bill 210459, Yet, like, how are we going to push it through? So that's my first question. And then my second question is, like, it's specifically to Staff Inspector Francis Healy, is the idea of the program, like, who is identified in dispatch to figure out who essentially is going to go out to these to these issues and um, and he said specifically that social the social work role is a basic script and what jumped out to me is like de-escalating as a social worker is a trained job that we do it's not something that a police officer 
can read, you know, a couple pages and do this. This is a skill. So, yeah, so it's just a skill. So I'm questioning that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony and for being with us and for your patience today. And we'll have the next uh, person to testify. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Next, we have Kristen Richter. Hi, my name is Kristen Richter. I have a statement prepared, but I'd like to preface this by saying that I'm really, really disappointed by the lack of actually mentally ill voices being heard. It's about three hours, and I'm watching council members leave. So hopefully somebody will hear what I have to say. Um, and please don't use that bell for the sake of my, my sensory issues. I really would appreciate that. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. In the spirit of normalizing pronouns, I use she, her, and hers. In the spirit of May being Mental Health Awareness Month, I am normalizing mental illness. I am bipolar too, and any prejudices or stigma that follow are your own. I apologize if I exceed three minutes. It's rare that mentally ill voices are centered. We are usually silent, discredited, spoken for, or made invisible. Judy Hume once said regarding her activism, I had no choice as a disabled person. I was either, I was going to either have to get involved with changing the system that limited me or not participate in society. Much like Judy, I am here to participate. I support mobile crisis teams, but I recognize they are the band-aid on a hemorrhage if they're left as the only remedy. Will these teams prevent police misconduct all over, remove stigma regarding mental health, treat the 60% of Americans that need but are not receiving mental health care, address mental health impacts of the opioid epidemic, generational trauma created by gun violence, or solve for departmental record data analysis gaps relating to individuals with mental health challenges? Earlier this year, FOP President John McNesby called charges that were based on an autistic man's statement as well as his mother's statement faithless, implying his officers were beyond reproach while an autistic man and his mother were not. That enforcement of mental health stigma cannot stand unanswered. Several times I've come across the, the statistic that police officers are more likely to complete suicide than be killed in the line of duty. How does this happen? I can tell you it occurs in a professional culture where our men and women in uniform cannot get the treatment they need because of a stigma perpetuated by their FOP president and other leaders who dismiss the autistic and does not make it possible for the police to receive treatment with, without threatening their career track. This is what we as a society ask of our police. Richard F Florida, in his book, The New Urban Crisis, describes cities as being living organisms. And no two are the same. I agree. What works for some cities will not work for Philadelphia. I believe the city needs to partner with an entity such as the University of Pennsylvania to create a study that will provide data-driven solutions specifically for Philadelphia. This must include finding ways to remove the mental health stigma in, in, bi, in, in BIPOC communities. We also need to start realizing the problems we face are a mental health crisis. Gun violence is a mental health crisis. Poverty, hunger, oppression, marginalization, racism, bigotry, discrimination, etc., are all mental health crises. We need to realize what the opioid epidemic is doing to our communities and that the specific mental health crisis cannot be fixed. We need to realize that the opioid, oh, sorry, um, it, it cannot be fixed with free needles and Narcan that this specific mental health crisis is making our communities and city weak. It places approximately between 60 to $70 million from our local economy yearly, not to mention the generational trauma it creates and the lives that are stolen. Uh, this next quote is from the analysis of the criminal justice system's data architecture. Uh, the author is Diane Lacey, um, and this is her abstract. The criminal justice system in the United States is a complex national enterprise consisting of a multitude of independent units of government jurisdictions and agencies 
that must coordinate their activities in order to achieve a common goal, an efficient and effective justice system. To effectively coordinate these activities, system stakeholders must effectively share information. However, due to its diversity and decentralization, this justice system lacks a common framework for sharing data. In other words, it lacks common data architecture. The primary hypothesis of this project was that while the justice community has invested significantly in developing information sharing standards, which are critical components of data architecture, it has not developed a complete enterprise view of the justice process that properly identifies all the components required to understand the entire enterprise, nor has it properly scaled these exchanges to maximize their utility across organizational boundaries. After hearing all these testimonies, this definitely applies to Philadelphia. The police are a small part of a complicated criminal justice system that those suffering with mental illness are expected to navigate. It's already a given that Philadelphia's system is difficult. There are so many questions. What services am I applicable for? How do I find them? I'm a protected class. What are my rights? This paperwork I'm expected to sign, do I actually understand it? Philadelphia needs a core archival system to improve efficiency, accountability, and progress. Having a data-driven system is necessary for a city that is the size of Philadelphia. Please keep all this in mind while creating mental health mobile units and demand from our politicians that we deserve. Walter Wallace should have never have been released from prison without being rehabilitated. A young officer should never have been forced to shoot him, and a family should not have been made co-victims. Why the DA's office, led by DA Krasner, did not put Mr. Wallace into a diversion program or insist on treatment is well beyond my understanding. In the name of progress, we've been playing money ball with the criminal justice system. Let's get the numbers down, you know, the numbers we actually share. Meanwhile, violent offenders are released without being rehabilitated. We need transparency and organization, accessibility, and data-driven progress in order for smaller programs like crisis intervention units to be effective. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And um, if we could have the next person uh, who's been uh, uh, patiently waiting, uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Next, we have Sergio Sia. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Sorry, let me just pull up what I had. <laughs> you caught sure. me off guard here a little bit. Um, all right, thanks. Sorry, I'll start now. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergio Say. I'm an organizer with Reclaim and a Democratic Committee person, the 46th Ward um, in West Philadelphia. I want to begin by thanking Council for allowing testimony on this important conversation. Um, I live in a collective house of six people. And throughout the pandemic, we supported each other as best as we could. But one housemate became more and more isolated during the pandemic and stopped talking to us. And at the beginning of the year, I reached out to have a conversation about what I felt were interpersonal tensions in the house. But in our conversation, it became increasingly clear that my housemate was going through psychosis. My housemate described to me and other tenants how they were hearing voices for a while and believed I and other tenants could also hear those voices in addition to my housemate's thoughts and dreams. My housemate described uh, to me and tenants being that, that uh, we were part of some conspiracy um, and compared what they were going through to films like Stranger Than Fiction, The Truman Show, and Rosemary's Baby. We suggested they talk about what they were experiencing with friends and family or trained mental health professionals, but they refused. And as the days went on, they became louder, more erratic, angrier at us for not admitting to hearing their thoughts, um, and ultimately started sexually harassing me, uh, which has continued to this day. Um, in one of the moments of extreme psychosis, we called mental health crisis service lines who suggested uh, calling 302. We described what was going on and they advised us to put away all the sharps, as they said, in preparation for the mobile crisis unit. Um, but the unit was busy on a call after call um, and it took hours to like hear from them and, and we had to call them kind of constantly to the drivers to check on their status. In the meantime, my housemate had discovered the missing knives and started texting us about it, singing about knives loudly in the hallway, 
and sending us pictures of them licking a plastic knife that they had found. I felt and still feel threatened and scared by my housemate, but as someone who was pepper sprayed by the police on 52nd Street last year, and someone who knows well the story of Walter Wallace, I have a lot of fears of involving the city or the police in a situation that could harm me or leave um, me feeling like I had blood on my hands if they harmed my housemate, who is black and queer. Um, the conversations with 302 made it seem like I wouldn't be seen without the police and without stating that my housemate had verbalized specific violent threats against me, um, and I couldn't do that. Ultimately, the crisis, uh, the mobile crisis units, after hours of us waiting, chose not to come because we wouldn't say those magic words of this person has made violent threats against me or themselves. Um, they had lots of people waiting for them and ultimately decided out of urgency that our situation wasn't as dire as others. I felt I had no real help or support from the city. Um, we need to invest in mobile crisis response dispatches that are separate from the police and co-responders. People in my situation or worse should not have to deal with the hours of not knowing what to expect, if anything, when they call 302. I have a lot of anger and resentment for my abusive housemate, but I also don't think they deserve to die. Um, and the city needs to make big and bold investments in health care resources that include mental health. And we could do this if council moved away from tax cuts um, that they've been suggesting to conversations about how to tax the rich and have them pay their fair share. I believe health care should be a human right. And if it was, I wouldn't be actively being traumatized in my home today. Thank you so much for listening to my testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and for sharing your story. Thank you. Um, if we could have the next person, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Hi, everyone. My name, good afternoon, members of City Council. My name is Katia Perez, and I am the Mass Liberation Organizer at Reclaim Philadelphia. I'm here to testify and to ask that City Council fully fund mobile crisis units that operate completely separate from the police department. I am asking that you all commit to vote no on the co-responder model I am asking that you all prioritize the well-being of the most vulnerable among us in Philadelphia. Uh, this includes black, brown, and poor Philadelphians, returning citizens, immigrants, and children who learn from an early age to fear and distrust the police. My mother was undocumented during her first eight years in the United States. She met and married a man who turned out to be very abusive. Um, I was taught to never call the police. The police asked too many questions, and my mom didn't want them asking her about her immigration status. 20 years later, I myself was in a very toxic relationship that turned abusive, and every once in a while, there were episodes of violence. Intimate partner violence, domestic violence, is a behavioral health issue and needs to be addressed by a trauma-informed mental health specialist, not the police. I described during a previous hearing testimony an incident on Broad Street near Temple University where I tried contacting emergency uh, mental health services, but there was no one that could help. That wasn't the only incidence of violence where I desperately needed help, but I knew that calling the police was not the answer. There are several reasons why people will avoid calling the police. Issues of immigration, if anyone in the household is on probation or parole, if there's active drug use in the household. When people are in crisis and in need to help, the last thing we want to worry about is the threat of arrest or death by cops. I ask that City Council make sure that the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services has the investment needed to be well equipped to handle mental health crises without the police. We need to make sure everyone responding and in facilities are trained in trauma-informed practices. We do not need a co-responder model. We need fully funded mobile crisis units uh, separate from the police. We need a Department of Behavioral Health that is well equipped to address the trauma caused by poverty, incarceration, over-policing, and white supremacy. We need healing and care, not more cops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, our next speaker, if we can have you state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. We have no more speakers today. No more speakers oh, today. We have oh, someone just called, just called in. Yeah, hold on, please.
Yes, I believe it, it's Kelly Jude. This is. Okay, please state your name for the record, Kelly, and begin with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Kelly Jude. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I've been working in Philadelphia community mental health uh, for the entirety of my career. And I really just want to stress the need for treatment and not trauma. I know that the question has been posed that, uh, of who do Philadelphians want to see when they call 911 for help when a mental health crisis arises. And I would suggest that there actually is only one answer as opposed to no single answer. And, and that answer is a, a mental health clinician. That the, the answer really just lies in uh, appropriate treatment. All clinical conditions deserve clinically appropriate care. And I don't think the burden should be placed on um, cops and the police districts to, to deal with something that they have not been trained and, and haven't gone um, through formal education for. Um, I believe that everyone uh, deserves the best care. And I would like to really stress that everyone in Philadelphia may not be aware that when someone experiences a mental health crisis and um, everything is put into place for an involuntary commitment, that these individuals are put in handcuffs. They are transported by police and they are in the back of a van that um, it doesn't matter if this is someone who is an elderly woman that's suffering with dementia. It doesn't matter if it's a combat veteran that's struggling with uh, flashbacks. It doesn't matter if it's um, someone who is just a grieving widow and uh, just needs help it doesn't matter they're simply all put into some type of restraint they are handcuffed if we you have a, a police officer who is um, trained somewhat they may be willing to cuff them in front instead of in back but either way the message is clear which is that there seems to be this notion that mental health conditions means that you're a criminal and the only way to treat someone with dignity and respect and to really respond to the call of a mental health crisis is to actually get someone help. And anyone who is a parent and looks back in the photo album can see Santa Claus pictures when, when a child is an infant or a toddler or really young, um, that just being placed in front of Santa Claus and put on their lap creates tears and, 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 and fear and it's not because Santa Claus and the person in that uniform has bad intentions. It's actually the opposite. But it's because there's something tied to the uniform. There's something tied to um, just being in the presence of something that you're not anticipating. So I want you to think of, you know, the photo albums that everyone has and, and the fact that, you know, bias is implicit. And it's, the, the burden shouldn't be placed on police to unlearn this deeply embedded bias because it's just not going to happen. Um, the fact remains that intentions are always secondary to bias. And in times of crisis, we always revert back to what we know on an instinctual level. And I just don't think that it's anything that police can ever be properly trained for. And I don't think that it's anything that the average civilian and citizen can be prepared for when they see um, a holster with a gun on the side or a taser or someone in a cop uniform. It, it just doesn't communicate that we're here to help you in mental health crisis. So well, I think it's you. time to decriminalize mental health. I could not agree with you more. Thank you very much for your testimony and for calling in today. Uh, and I Thank think you. that uh, there's agreement across the board that uh, we do not want to criminalize or stigmatize mental health, um, especially since it's been that's that's been the pattern so much in the past. So thank you so much for being here with Wonderful. us today. And thank uh, you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. And I also want to acknowledge that Councilmember Member Bobby Heenan has joined us. And um, is there anyone else here who uh, wanted to testify and whose name we have not called? Anyone? Any member of council that uh, wanted to make a statement? 
Okay, there being no further questions from members or the committee and no other witnesses to testify, I will ask if there's anyone else present in this hearing whose name we have failed to call and that wishes to offer testimony on the bill or resolution being offered today, uh, which we have done and hearing none, I wanna thank all the panels and witnesses for their participation. We value your opinions and uh, I now must invite all panels and witnesses to please disconnect from the meeting before we go into our public meeting. And we will now pause the proceedings briefly as multiple participants, participants will leave uh, this hearing. So uh, please disconnect. Okay. All right, uh, so this concludes the public hearing of the committee. We'll now go into our public meeting to consider the action to be taken on the bill before this committee today. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll to take attendance? Members that are in attendance will please indicate that you are present when your name is called and also please say a few brief words. Uh, Madam Clerk. Council Member Heenan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am present. Thank you. Council Member O. I am present. Council Member Gim. Thank you. Present. Council Member Green. Council Member Thomas. Council Member Brooks. Chair Bass. Thank you, I am present. Okay, now that we have established a quorum, uh, the chair notes, uh, uh, the chair recognizes council member Heenan for a motion to the amendment to bill number 210364. Thank you, Madam Chair. I offer an amendment to bill number 210364. A copy of this amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee and I move for the amendment to bill number 210364 be approved. Can we get a second? Second. Thank you. The chair notes for the record that council member Gim seconds the motion and it's been moved and properly seconded that the amendment to bill number 210364 be approved. All of those in favor of this motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone, op anyone opposed? Okay, the ayes have it, the motion carries. And the amendment to bill number 210364 has been approved. Uh, chair now recognizes council member Heenan for a motion on bill number 210364 as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move that bill number 210364 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit the first reading of this bill at our next session of council. Second. The chair notes for the record that council member Gim seconds the motion. It's been moved and properly seconded that bill number 210364 as amended be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. All of those in favor of the motion will signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? No? Okay. The ayes have it and the motion carries. This concludes the business before the Committee on Public Health and Human Services today. I wanna to thank everyone for attending and I really wanna thank everyone for providing information, having a, a open dialogue and conversation and really informing council and the public uh, regarding the co-responder model and also uh, the crisis uh, intervention units, which are very much needed in the city of Philadelphia. Thank you so much everyone for your attendance. Have a great weekend and please be safe. Thank you.